Good evening. The March 7th, 2022 legislative meeting of the Anne Arundel County Council is now in session. Please silence all electronic devices at this time. Please pause for the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to introduce Pastor Travis Knoll from Nichols Bethel United Methodist Church. Just real quickly, for those of you who don't know, it's right on 175 and they do a lot of great community aspects. I'm going to mention three because they really help in our area. The Odenton Elementary Angels, the Wildcat Mentor Program, and of course, many of you heard Backpack Buddies for Anne Arundel County Public Schools, which a lot of people support. Thank you for your service and we appreciate you uh, coming to give us a prayer this evening. Thank you. Okay. I will uh, endeavor to be brief. I, um, I thought I would do this in the form of a, of a prayer, inviting God's presence. So let us take a moment to pray. God, we are people of different beliefs and opinions and perspectives. That's more or less the point of a council of this sort, is to bring those together and hammer them out together. But uh, we invite not just a wisdom that's greater than any one of ours, sort of a sum of the parts, but I, God, invite you to be present in this deliberation and in this session that your wisdom might prevail and that your guidance might help us to find a wisdom that brings peace with justice to the people that we are pleased to represent and serve in this county. Amen. Amen. Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Secretary, please read the ethics statement. The Ethics Commission has asked that I advise you that under certain circumstances, members of the public may qualify as lobbyists when they testify before the County Council. If so, the law requires that certain information be filed with the Ethics Commission. The Chairman of the Ethics Commission has asked that those who wish to testify in any form review the general information on lobbying sheet located on the Ethics website under Forms and Publications. If there are any questions about the lobbying requirements, please contact the Ethics Commission at 410 222 4413. Thank you, Madam Secretary. We will now open our invitation to audience. Madam Secretary, do we have any comments or communications on any subject matter not included in the printed agenda received from members of the public? Uh, Madam Chair, we did receive one submission. It was um, really for a, a bill being heard tonight, so we did transfer that piece of testimony to the appropriate bill. So there is no online testimony that was received. Thank you very much. We will now invite members of the audience who signed up before the meeting to address the council briefly on any subject not included in the printed agenda. Remarks will be limited to two minutes. Um, my understanding is no one signed up ahead of time for this part of the um, public uh, testimony, but if there is anyone here who wishes to speak, please come up to the table and state your name and address for the record. You have two minutes. You may proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, David Dull, uh, Savannah Park, Maryland. Um, man, I'm the only one up here for two minutes. You get to speak to county council. Um, geez, what are we talking about? So uh, I guess the mass mandates are done, huh? Right? Like uh, the science must have changed or we're, I don't know, but um, I guess now we don't have to worry about the N95 masks that are actual PPE used to protect us. Um, it's going to be interesting, uh, talking about a bill later and uh, police accountability, but it's interesting that we think about uh, the police are the ones who are going to um, uh, ensure that these mandates happen. So uh, to those of you on the right, let's just think about that when we talk about police accountability. Thanks. All right, seeing no additional movement in the audience, the invitation to audience is now closed. Is there any item any council member would like to place on the agenda? Madam Chair. Yes. Um, just for the record for Madam Secretary, could I be added as a co-sponsor to 1722? So noted. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, may I have a motion that the partial reading of any bill, resolution, amendment to bill or resolution, or minutes constitutes the reading of the whole? So move, Councilman Prusky. Second, Allison Pickard. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion carries. Madam Secretary, please read the minutes of February 22nd, 2022. 
The meeting was called to order by Chair Radvian at 7 p.m. and opened with the invocation given by Kyle Pullen, a member of the Lighthouse Baptist Church in Severna Park, and was followed by the Pledge of Allegiance led by Mr. Volke. The meeting was held in the County Council Chambers, Arundel Center, Annapolis, Maryland. There were approximately 25 persons in the audience. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the minutes of February 22nd, 2022? So moved, Allison Pickard. Is there a second? Feather second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. The minutes of February 22nd, 2022 stand approved as read. Madam Secretary, please read the titles of any bills to be introduced this evening. Bill number 2722, an ordinance concerning pensions, contingent, annuant, Fire and police service require retirement plans, same-sex marriage. Bill number 2822, an ordinance concerning personnel, positions in the classified service. Bill number 2922, an ordinance concerning current expense budget, supplementary appropriations. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Please read the titles of any resolutions to be introduced this evening. We have no resolutions to be introduced this evening, Madam Chair. All right, thank you very much. Madam Secretary, please read the title of Bill Number 8-22 as amended. Bill Number 8-22, an ordinance concerning zoning 2022 green infrastructure master plan. All right, this is an admin bill and I see the admin team coming down to the table. Good evening. Go ahead, Mr. Barron. Thank you. Uh, joining me at the table is Matt Johnston, uh, Michael Stringer from OPC, Erica Matthews from Reckon Parks, and Kelly Kenny from the Office of Law. Uh, as a reminder, this bill was heard at the last meeting, discussed at the work session. We understand there's an amendment coming, which we'll discuss at the appropriate time. I'll keep my remark short, the plan sets up a framework for voluntary actions to conserve the largest connected natural areas in the county, as well as investing in green space in underserved communities. We're happy to answer any questions or move to the amendment when appropriate. Thank you. Are there any questions from the council? All right, seeing none, we will now open the public hearing on bill number 8-22 as amended. Madam Secretary, do we have any testimony received from members of the public? No, Madam Chair, we did not receive anything ahead of time. All right, we will now invite members of the audience who signed up before the meeting to address the council on bill number 8-22 as amended. Remarks will be limited to two minutes. All right, no one had signed up ahead of time here either, but if there is anyone who wishes to address the council on this bill, you may come up to the table and state your name and address for the record. And I do see one person coming on down, so come on down. You may proceed, you have two minutes. Esteemed members of the Anaroma County Council, thank you for here, hearing me. Uh, my name is Fernando Barra. I'm running for County Executive. Um, on February 22, 22, the Office of Planning and Zoning stated that the Green Infrastructure Master Plan was not a regulatory plan. This cannot be further from the truth. First of all, once the plan is enacted, all the green areas will be under the supervision of the county. Any property owner will be at the mercy of PNC and IMP to have any permit approved. Regulations will take place without having anything, anyone to go through the complicated process that Mr. Kai Sigler claimed to be necessary to make it regulatory. Even now, the PNC is bypassing those processes with the Greenway Master Plan of 2002. I provided to you uh, some documents prior to this. One of them is the decision by Mr. Holman, who works for PNZ, for my various applications in which he denied my application because he presented a clear conflict with the spirit of the Greenway Master Plan. On page 15, Mr. Holman's decision states that it should be pointed out that the office has not granted an application to build a pool in the critical area in over 20 years. This statement is very, very concerning. One, the county is using the master plan as a regulatory plan to deny permits. Number two, the county has a predisposition to automatically deny permits when they feel that they are in conflict with any conservation program. Number three, and most important, Mr. Holman has violated the constitutional and property rights of hundreds of Anaroma County citizens for more than 20 years. The plan is not voluntarily. 
It doesn't give you any credits for taxes, and it uh, doesn't increase the property value. I explained that on my letter to you. First of all, the plan is not voluntarily because the property owner is forced to sign a conservation deed of easement, easement and agreement in order to the permit to move forward. This conservation deed of agreement gives the county the right to enter the property any time without any probable cause. This is a clear violation of the Fourth Amendment right of the United States Constitution. There are thousands of these conservation deeds of agreements in the Arnoldo County Circuit Court land records. As you can see, there is no indication that they will utilize the master plan to regulate. Therefore, there is no reason why you or any citizen should trust PNZ and IP to act ethically or lawfully. I believe that we can pass this plan. In order to guarantee, but we need to guarantee that PNC will not use this green infrastructure master plan to regulate or negate any permit application. The proposed bill 8-22 should spill out completely the provisions that will provide due process, accountability, and safeguards to the citizens of this county. They're the same citizens that choose you to protect those rights. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oops, pardon me. Thank you very much. Um, seeing no additional movement in the audience, the public hearing on Bill Number 8-22, as amended, is now closed. Madam Secretary, please read the title of Bill Number 8-22, as amended. Bill Number 8-22, an ordinance concerning zoning 2022 green infrastructure master plan. All right, there is one amendment. Madam Secretary, please read Amendment Number 4. This amendment provides that the 2022 Green Infrastructure Master Plan is not a regulatory document. Uh, Ms. Pickard, this is your amendment. You may make a brief statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this amendment is very short. It does add um, <coughs> the language, and I'll just read it because it's that short. Into the code, section 18-2-103, planning for future development, green infrastructure master plan, the 2022 green infrastructure master plan is not regulatory, does not have the force of law, and does not impose restrictions on development or land use in the county. Motion to adopt. Is, is, oh, is there a second? Second. All right, thank you very much. Um, is there any discussion from my colleagues? Mr. Barron. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, appreciate uh, the sponsor sharing that amendment with us in advance. I think the administration has been clear since we introduced this bill, uh, since we drafted the plan, this is not intended to be a regulatory document. Uh, the amendment, if it further clarifies, we're comfortable with it. Any additional comments from my colleagues? Ms. Pickard, is that you? Nope, oh, you're just, that's um, fine. <laughs> All right, in that case, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on amendment number four. Ms. Lacey. Aye. Ms. Pickard. Aye. Mr. Volke. Aye. Mr. Prusky. Aye. Ms. Fiedler. Aye. Ms. Hare. Aye. Ms. Rodvian. Aye. Seven in the affirmative, none in the negative. Amendment number four is adopted. All right, um, bill number 8-22 as amended will be heard on March 21st, 2022. Madam Secretary, please read the title of bill number 16-22. Bill number 16-22, an ordinance concerning police accountability board. All right, um, this is another administration bill and I know you've got a, a number of folks down at the table with you, but you may proceed when you are ready. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, joining me is our police chief, Chief Awid. Um, we also have Rhonda McCoy from the city who is here somewhere making her way up, I'm sure. Uh, we have uh, Ms. Lori Blair Klausmeyer from the Office of Law and Ethan Hunt. I believe this is his inaugural appearance at the County Council, um, as well as a number of folks in the audience uh, if needed. Uh, for their expertise, including our director, director of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, Pete Hill, our Human Relations Officer, Asha Smith, and uh, our Chief of Staff of our Police Department, Mr. Dave Morris, um, as well as I'm sure there's other experts here too. Um, I do have a PowerPoint um, that I'd like to go through if uh, Madam Administrator can get it up. 
Um, this is basically the presentation I provided at the work session. I will try to go quickly um, because I know we have a lot to discuss today. I think this uh, is important, though, for the public, uh, many of whom are joining us for the first time, Thank for you. us to go through this. Mr. Barron, before you begin, I just want to announce for the um, audience who's watching on TV or on the live stream that this um, presentation is available on the county website um, or the, the county council Council website. Ready? I'm ready whenever you are. Um, so, uh, and why don't we just go to the next slide and jump right in? Um, we're here for 1622 uh, because in 2021, the state of Maryland passed a package of police reform legislation, uh, including a bill mandating body-worn cameras. Our chief will tell you we're already well ahead of that state requirement, uh, as well as reforms to the Public Information Act, how no-knock warrants are conducted, Restrictions on surplus military equipment, a new uh, investigation uh, process for potential police involved deaths of civilians, um, and HB 670, which among a number of reforms, mandates that counties establish police accountability boards. The police accountability board appoints members to the administrative charging committees, which are new under 670, and reforms how trial boards are conducted. Why don't we go to the next slide? HB 670 requires each county to create one police accountability board. Their duties are prescribed in state law to provide policy advice, to work with law enforcement agencies, to improve matters of policing and police accountability in the county, to appoint civilian members to the administrative charging committee and trial boards, receive complaints of police misconduct filed by members of the public. In Anne Arundel County, the PAB will be responsible for working with the Anne Arundel County Police, the City of Annapolis, the Sheriff, the Anne Arundel Community College, and the Crofton Law Enforcement Agencies. Why don't we go to the next one? So the county has been working to implement uh, the requirements of the state law since it was passed. We, we broke up our process in, in four phases. Um, phase one was reviewing the law, and, and we're gonna go through a lot of this. It is dense and complicated stuff. Um, we developed an outreach plan. We created materials for such that outreach plan. And if you all recall, the Maryland Association of Counties came to this body and briefed you, I believe, in January. Um, we then moved to stakeholder engagement where we uh, engaged with various members of the community, stakeholder groups, experts. We noted concerns, collected feedback, and tried to incorporate some of that feedback in. Obviously, there are many different opinions on how to approach this, and not everybody's feedback made it into the bill. We're now in phase three, the legislative process. We introduced 1622. We're here at the public hearing. Um, we um, are looking to get, you know, I know there's a number of amendments tonight. That's part of the process, and we're going to discuss them. Uh, we also have put up a website, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, Next, uh, we'll move into the final phase uh, to get ready for implementation. We'll need to hire and train staff. We'll need to develop processes, necessary forms, public information portals. The state law 
is mandated to go into effect July 1st, 2022. So beginning July 1st, our police accountability board needs to be set up and ready uh, for the public to bring complaints forward. So we need to implement this new state structure because beginning July 1st, one of the things that was in, embedded in, in HB 670 was the repeal of the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights. So all public complaints of alleged police misconduct have to go through this new process. So why don't we go to the next one? So we made this um, flow chart in part because if you're like me, you need a visual to understand how this a complaint will move through the process. And um, if you can zoom in on your screen if you have it, if it's a little hard to read, I'll give a quick overview. The Police Accountability Board under HB 670 um, can receive complaints from the public. By state law, it must forward that complaint to the appropriate law enforcement agency within three days. Additionally, it has requirements under state law to quarterly review the outcomes of disciplinary matters, annually report to the county on uh, the trends, and make policy recommendations. And finally, has appointment authority under state law for the administrative charging committee and the trial boards. A complaint of police misconduct, the, the green bubble can also come into a law enforcement agency. Member of the public can make a complaint to the LEA or to the Police Accountability Board. In either method of complaint, the law enforcement agency is required by law to investigate that complaint. Upon the completion of the investigation, they forward the investigatory file to the Administrative Charging Committee. The Administrative Charging Committee, and we'll talk more about that um, in, in later parts of this, and I'm sure throughout the night, has the statutory re responsibility to review the investigatory file and determine whether or not to charge the officer. In either outcome, the Administrative Charging Committee must issue a written report. If it determines the allegations are unfounded or the officer is exonerated, it must issue that written report within a year and a day of the filing of the complaint. If the officer is charged within a year and a day of the filing of the complaint, it must issue its written opinion uh, and recommend discipline based on a disciplinary matrix. The disciplinary matrix under state law is developed by the Maryland Police Training and Standards Commission and the chief of that law enforcement agency may apply the discipline under the matrix that's recommended by the Administrative Charging Committee or a more uh, strict, a higher level of discipline. Once that discipline is imposed, the officer can appeal. If the officer decides not to appeal, the matter is final and the discipline is opposed. If the officer does not, if the officer appeals, it moves to the trial board process. And the trial board, and we'll talk more about this in a second, um, has a hearing and issues a decision. And then if the officer appeals, uh, it goes to circuit court. If the officer does not appeal within 30 days, the trial board's decision is final. We'll go to the next slide. This is the, the bill that we uh, put forward. Um, as you all are aware, um, and I mentioned it before, we are on a little bit of a timeline based on the state rules, uh, but H, or HP 670 has a lot of components. 
Police Accountability Board is one, and it is the responsibility of every jurisdiction in the county, every county to, I screwed that up, every jurisdiction in the state, every county in the state to create one Police Accountability Board. And that is the bill before you today. So let's go to the next slide and we'll talk briefly about what the state law requires as it relates to police accountability board duties. I mentioned they have to hold meetings with law enforcement. The state rule is at least quarterly. Um, they uh, receive complaints. They do outcomes and reporting. And they also make appointments. The board shall appoint two civilian members to the administrative charging committee. The board shall appoint one civilian member who's not a member of the administrative charging committee to the trial board. And um, the chair of the PAB or their designee who's also a member of the PAB serves on the administrative charging committee. Why don't we go to the next one? Um, state law requires uh, certain prohibitions. An active police officer may not be a member of the Police Accountability Board. State law requires um, that to the extent practicable, the membership shall reflect the racial, gender, and cultural diversity of the county. The state law requires local establishment of how the board is actually constituted, how many members. So the proposal before you has nine voting members. One of the members is the chair. One of the nine members is an Annapolis resident. And all three, all members must be residents of the county for three years. Go to the next one. Um, the appointment process also allows some local flexibility. The uh, county executive is uh, proposing that the um, CE, the county executive appoints and the county council confirms prior to any um, term the, uh, the county shall make a public announcement before the appointment is made and invite people to apply. And members or people applying are subject to a background check. The chair appointment we're proposing, it is appoint, appointed by the county executive and confirmed by the council. The membership terms, we are proposing three years uh, initial appointments are staggered, so the entire board does not turn over in one, um, one year. The chair would serve for three years, and then a two-year uh, term limit, although members would be able to come back after um, a break. Go to the next one. Um, also some local flexibility here. The proposal before you includes ex officio membership. Uh, included as non-voting ex officio members, we included individuals with expertise and knowledge that will be valuable to the board, including our county's equity, diversity, and inclusion, and human relations officer, our chief's designee, the sheriff's designee, and the city of Annapolis's chief's designee. For vacancies and removals, um, if for some reason someone resigns or is removed, uh, they, the manner of appointment must go through the same process. The county exec would appoint and the council would confirm. The county executive may remove a member for cause. And some descriptions there. Why don't we go to the next one? In order to get the board to have the right balance of expertise and experience. We listed uh, diversity of skills and experience that we felt 
should be considered to be included on the accountability board. This includes folks active in civil rights organizations, expertise in behavioral health, um, training in sociology, education, social work, or criminology, expertise and experience in the management of a law enforcement agency, managing personnel discipline matters, um, and uh, things like juvenile services, as well as other life experience. That list is meant to be an example, not, um, not everything, so people could have different skills. Move into the next one. Um, this work will require a budget and will require staff. Um, we recommend, and there's a bill uh, before you to create the positions. This bill also references an executive director and administrative secretary. Additionally, we have language in the bill as it relates to contractual services and a budget that should be um, uh, approved by the county council and a requirement that the county executive assign staff as needed to fulfill the duties of the board. We also require that financial disclosure and conflict of interest and ethics forms are included for members of the board. Um, for record keeping, the executive secretary, um, well actually should, that should say the executive director keeps the records, uh, the county administration um, shall uh, set up the rules in accordance with state law. We'll go to the next slide. Um, the Police Accountability Board is subject to the Open Meetings Act. Uh, we included a reference in the bill to ensure that there's no mistake, that the, the board is requ uh, required to comply with the Open Meetings Act. In addition, um, the administration is bringing forward an amendment based on some conversations with an, a number of folks to require a public comment in addition to open meetings. So um, the Open Meetings Act requires the advertisement, the keeping of minutes, the public accessibility of the meeting, but there is actually no requirement for public comment. So we are adding with an amendment, I hope you will all support a requirement that the police accountability also accept public testimony. Go to the next one. So as, as we've discussed, the police accountability's responsibility is to oversee the trends, make policy recommendations and suggestions, um, and make appointments to the administrative charging committee and the trial boards. The administrative charging committee and the trial boards are set up in state law um, and are where the investigatory and adjudicatory functions of HB 670 rest. What the structure is of the administrative charging committee under 670 is five members. Um, their powers include um, reviewing the findings of the law enforcement agency. They can request additional information. They can issue subpoenas. They can review body camera footage, and they can call a police officer to appear with a representative. They make the determination to charge or not to charge the officer subject to the complaint. And again, going back to the flow chart, they're making um, those determinations in a written report. If they are recommending discipline, they have to file this, follow the state disciplinary matrix. Um, if they're not charging, they have to issue a written report. The trial boards are convened as needed based on whether or not um, an officer is appealing a decision out of the administrative charging committee. They are under state law established by the law enforcement agency where the officer who is the subject of the complaint is employed. And there are three members, and we'll talk about that more on the next slide. 
the administrative charging committee is made up, as I mentioned on the previous slide, of five uh, members, the chair of the police accountability board or the chair's designee, two civilian members selected by the police accountability board, two civilian members selected by the chief executive officer of the county. Um, before serving as a member of an administrative charging committee, the, they shall receive training based on um, regulations and procedures from the Maryland Police Training and Standards Commission. On the trial board side, it's three members, an active or retired administrative law judge, or a retired district or circuit court judge appointed by the county executive, a civilian who is not a member of the administrative charging committee appointed by the police accountability board, a police officer uh, of equal rank to the accused officer appointed by the chief of police. And that is the state laws, how that is composed. Their responsibility is to adjudicate the matter when the officer does not accept the discipline offered by the chief of police at the end of the administrative charging uh, committee process. Let's go to the next slide. I know that's a lot, and I know we've all met and talked about this a lot, but I thought it would be good for us to put the flow chart back up now that I've gone back through that. Um, again, this is how the state sets up a allegation of police misconduct, how that allegation moves through the adjudicatory process. The police accountability uh, board's responsibility is to forward that complaint to the law enforcement agency. It is the law enforcement agency's responsibility to investigate it. Upon their findings, they forward that file to the charging committee. The charging committee reviews it. The charging committee has powers such as calling witnesses, issuing subpoenas, reviewing body camera footage, asking the law enforcement agency for more information. All of that, they make their determination to charge or not to charge. It moves through that, those rules. In either outcome, there's a requirement of a written opinion. If the uh, decision is discipline, if the decision is not, if the decision is not accepted by the officer, it would then move to the trial board process. So as you can see, there's one police accountability board per county, one administrative charging committee per county, and then there could be multiple trial boards going on depending on um, the volume of the complaints at the time. So let's go to the next slide. Just to give a sense of the timeline again, um, back at the beginning of the year, we officially began our stakeholder engagement and outreach. Uh, beginning of February, we introduced our bill. Um, we are here, we're at our public hearing. Um, in April and May, we hope to be submitting names to the council for approval to sit on this board hope for the board to be able to meet before the state law goes into effect July 1st so that we can hire, train uh, staff, develop the procedures, um, develop the forms that we're going to need. It's not as simple as turning a light switch on and being ready to go. So last slide, um, encourage everyone to get involved. This is the beginning of a new way of addressing um, uh, police accountability. The state changed the rules and we have to implement it. But this bill is not the end of the discussion. The PAB has responsibility moving forward. We will have to make sure that we implement this. We are going to need good, civic-minded people from all walks of life to build a strong board that does its work well. If you go to the website, we have an interest application up so we can start collecting 
names of people start the initial round of vetting, no application will be closed until after the council passes the bill and enough time elapse um, because we know there are a number of amendments, there might be changes, but if, if you go back to that slide on the timeline, we, we are under a ticking clock from the state and we know that we need to get this moving. Um, so we want to get as many people who are interested in this to uh, get that process started. So anybody that's watching at home or here in the audience that wants to serve, you can go to the website, you can fill out an interest application and um, get your name on the list to begin the vetting process. Because at the end of the day, the administration is going to have to bring down appointments. This council is going to have to consider the appointments embedded in our bill is a requirement that there's a public hearing for those appointments. So all of that takes time. So with that, and, and before we open it up to questions, I'm going to turn it over to our chief for a couple of quick comments and then i um, happy to answer any questions or move to public testimony. Thank you, Mr. Barron. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair, County Council. Um, for the record, my name is Amal Awad. I serve as your Chief of Police for the Anne Arundel County Police Department. And I thank you um, for the opportunity this evening uh, to speak on behalf of Bill Number 1622 per pertaining to the Police Accountability Board. Um, I do wish to recognize Mr. Barron um, for the work he and his office have completed on behalf of the county executive to get this bill before the council this evening, as well as the work of many others involved in this process. Um, I promise to be brief. Um, in my nearly 30 years of policing, having served now in three law enforcement agencies, um, I've witnessed an unequaled evolution in professional policing standards. Um, for example, your Anne Arundel County Police Department um, is accredited by the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies, also known as CALEA. Um, we've been since the early 90s, um, and that requires agencies to meet um, establish an established set of hundreds of standards, professional standards, and is subjected to continuous audits. Um, Anne Arundel County is one of only 32 of the hundreds of police departments within the state of Maryland and Maryland agencies um, to have earned this esteemed accreditation. Um, and one of only 945 in the United States. Um, that gold standard um, in public safety should serve as a source of pride for this agency and Anne Arundel County. Um, last year, upon CALEA's conclusion of their assessment of our department from our operations to investigations to administration to patrol, to community engagement, they closed our exit interview with the following remarks. We need more Anne Arundels, and they're speaking nationally. Words matter, and that's a huge compliment and testament to the character, the hearts, and the minds of the men and women who proudly serve the Anne Arundel County Police Department and our residents. Um, the bill before the council tonight is designed to meet state-imposed mandates in HB 670, and I recognize and appreciate the difficult and challenging work that you have before you. Um, the state compulsory deadlines make this bill and these hearings that much more important. And let me be clear, a passage of a bill that creates a disciplinary process mandated by the state is critical. Without this bill, effective July 1, there is, will be no means of investigating a complaint made by a member of the public against a police officer. Um, failure to move forward is unfair to both our officers and the community uh, we serve, and it's equally imperative that this bill create a process that's fair, impartial, unbiased, and objective. During a time when retirements and resignations in law enforcement are at an all-time high, and recruitment at an all-time low, it's essential for public safety, our community's safety, that we get this right. The state dealt all the jurisdictions a hand, and we have a hand. Um, we have to play that hand that we're, we've been dealt. How we play that hand is up to this council. 
and I'm confident, we're confident in this council's ability to get this right. Thank you for your time, your commitment, um, and ensuring that Anne Arundel County remains a safe place to live and raise all of our families. Thank you. All right, at this time, um, I, we can take a few questions from my colleagues, but I also wouldn't mind jumping right into the public testimony if that would be all right. All right, seeing nods all around. Um, we will now open the public hearing on bill number 16-22. Madam Secretary, do we have testimony received from members of the public? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, we received 15 submissions through the online testimony tool that were specific to Bill 1622. Uh, there was also, it's worth mentioning, or at least giving honorable mention to um, a bunch of emails that we received over the weekend. Uh, there was about 99, give or take one or two here for some duplicates maybe, but they all bear this subject line of support Bill 1622 with amendments. So just wanted to mention that. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. We will now open the public hearing on bill number 16-22. Um, at this time, we'll invite members of the audience who signed up before the meeting to address the council on bill number 16-22. Remarks will be limited to two minutes. I will, let's see, I see we have one, two, three, four, five, six chairs, so I will call um, groups of six down to the table. When you come down, um, we'll just go um, in the order that I have you on my list here. I will ask you to state your name and address for the record, and again, you'll have two minutes. All right, the first six names I have is Jennifer Sell, Marguerite Morris testing, testifying on behalf of For Kathy's Sake, um, Grace Myrick, Cynthia Williams, Linda Davis, and Emma Buckman. You may all come down. The first name I have on our list, again, is Jennifer Sell. State your name and address for the record, and you have two minutes. Good evening, council members. My name is Jennifer Sell, and I live at 444 Linwood Drive, Severna Park, Maryland, 21146. I'm here to ask you to pass a good bill that reflects the demands of the Anne Arundel County Coalition for Police Accountability. If you cannot, if you cannot meet these demands, I ask that you oppose this bill. Why should you oppose this bill? Because it is a bad piece of legislation that might be beyond repair. The Pittman administration had a job, which they claimed to have done, which was to reach out to members of the community and produce a piece of legislation that reflected the needs of the community. Did they do that? I don't think so, but they'll be up here in a few minutes and you can ask them. Although the fact they referenced themselves that people haven't seen their slides before today should be pretty telling. I think they created a bill that reflects the needs of law enforcement, but we don't need to provide more support to law enforcement. That's what got us here in the first place. So what can you do? You can oppose this bill unless it meets the demand of the people it is supposed to be supporting. After all, it's not your fault it's a horrible bill. It's as if the Pittman administration asked you to play soccer with them after school and promised they would bring the soccer ball, and then they showed up with a pile of manure instead of a soccer ball. And they looked at you and really did suggest you kick around a pile of manure. Would you do that, or would you say, this isn't a ball, it's a pile of manure. Not only does it smell, but it's going to fall apart after a few kicks. Go home and bring the soccer ball, or we're not playing with you. You have a choice. Do you want to play ball with this piece of stinky legislation? Do you want to be the ones who attempt to kick it into the goal? Or do you have the guts to say to the administration, bring us a soccer ball that we can actually kick and play with? Give us a bill that fits the needs of the community. And if you can't do that, we refuse to play ball with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Marguerite Morris, representing for Kathy's sake. Um, we have six chairs, but only four mics, so <laughs> we do have to share those. Thank you very much. Yeah. 
I'm also representing, uh, good, good evening everyone, I'm also representing community actively seeking transparency. And I want to say today that, the, first of all, I, I think that uh, we're at an all-time low in reference to our relationship with the police at this time, um, when the chief of police will not even give an audience to people like me to speak with the community, to, to speak with. But I'm here today because this is the 10th year anniversary of the passing of my daughter, Kathy Morris. Kathy died in 2012. And we're not anti-police, let me say that, because it was the testimony for the record of a retired police officer that made them change the death matter, the matter of death for Catherine Sarah Morris. We are not anti-police. We're anti-bad police. We have a lot of fine officers. So I want to say that what, when we went to the hearing to have that changed after nine long years of pressing for an independent agency, a civilian review board, a PAB, or whatever you want to call it, and it went before a judge, that judge issued not a one-page opinion, not a two-page opinion, but a 58-page opinion that the Anne Arundel County Police Department had aired along with the medical examiner. And you all have that testimony. In that evidence, it is clear, it is a fact. Evidence was suppressed, manipulated, reports were manipulated. We even got false DNA results in reference to my daughter. So I want to say today that we're here today. Um, I am Marguerite Morris. My address is, is uh, 701 Harvest Run Drive, apartment uh, 104 in Odenton. And again, we're here today because uh, we, uh, we oppose this bill without the demands or the amendments that we're asking for in community. And I'm saying for the record, we are not anti-police. We have a lot of fine police officers. We are anti-bad police, and we need this bill strengthen that it helps all the citizens of Anne Arundel County. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Morris, uh, Reverend Morris. Um, Grace Myrick. Uh, yes, my name is Grace Myrick, and I live uh, 670 Robert uh, Court, Glen Burnie, Maryland. Uh, I am the grandmother, and uh, I don't know if all you are in or you have uh, faced the part of losing a child. And I lost a child, and, and my daughter lost a child. It is so hot, felt, broken heart type of situation in that respect. And I witnessed along the way, my daughter and her husband fought this case tooth and nail. From uh, North Carolina, came before the, uh, the Army down there, to Maryland. And we've been in many uh, conferences with the police department the state attorney, and uh, I, I went this one time with the state attorney, and I am a 20-year uh, person in counseling and substance abuse. One of the things that we were taught of how to look at the body, English, and language of the body, you know, and, and this lady clearly was not interested in what my daughter had to say. She seemed to want to pass the buck. Now, I'm good at watching a person, what they say out of the mouth. Sometimes what they say out of the mouth is not really what they mean. You know, I've been with her many times along the years. I see her fort, fight, you know, go from different places and stuff, and she wouldn't give up. She wouldn't give up. And I remember this officer in uh, Fort in, in uh, North Carolina said, he commended her for not giving up. She said, he said that many women, uh, whoever had a complaint, once something hit her, them real hard, they never came back again. And I'm listening to all the, uh, the uh, whatever it is about this bill that I you know is bureaucracy for me, because I've been ran from it because it's too much, it's too complicated. You know, it's not plain down simple for the simple-minded, you know, like I'm a simple-minded person. I'm not simple-minded, but I like it to be something crystal clear that I can see. Ms. Myrick, I need you to conclude your remarks. Your two minutes okay, has expired. Okay, in other words, I'm against the bill, and I think it should be for the people and not for the sake of trying to pass the buck. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Linda Davis. Linda Davis, and I'm at 215 Coronet Drive in Linthicum, Maryland. I'm here also to express my opposition to the board bill as it is currently drafted because it does not include the recommendations of the Anne Arundel 
County Coalition for Police Accountability, which we have presented these recommendations to you, to the county executive, numerous times. I'm very concerned about the membership recommend, recommended for the board. I would like the membership to reflect the populations, identities, communities, and geographic areas that have the most law enforcement encounters instead of the county population at large and instead of people like me who have not been impacted by racial pro profiling and pr police brutality. The current version of the bill says that the voting membership of the board shall include representation from communities that experience a higher frequency of interactions with law enforcement. And then the bill goes on to say that it sh shall include a diversity of experience and expertise and it lists several general categories and disciplines. However, seven, just about half of the 15 categories are re related to law enforcement and the four others are adjacent to law enforcement. One of the categories is social work. And I am a social worker and I do not belong on this board. This is because I have not been impacted by police brutality and racial profiling. This is also because I believe that people with lived experience who have experienced police brutality and racial profiling have more knowledge of the problem and better ideas about how to solve it, not people like me. I ask you to seriously consider impacted people for membership on the board over people like me with letters behind our names. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Davis. And I realized I jumped over a name, Ms. Uh, Cynthia Williams. Cynthia Williams, president of the Western District at 7917 Citadel Drive in Severn. I believe that the Anne Arundel County Police Department are, uh, are doing an excellent job. Not only do they keep us safe, but they are proactive in their efforts to work with communities to prevent crime and nip problems in the bud, which makes communities safer. The police and community together, or PACT program, builds a strong bond with the communities, and especially the children mo most at risk in a troubling world, to build trust in the police. The county's mobile crisis unit has been deemed the best in the world, getting residents the help they need to deal with a variety of crises. Whether it be a mental health emergency, a drug abuse problem, or other issue, they find services for troubled individuals or families rather than arresting them. I do not support defunding the police. I support increasing funding for the police to be able to maintain or increase personnel numbers to keep up with the continuing increase in population, especially in Western District, and to fund the community policing pact and crisis response programs. <clears throat> <clears throat> Pardon me. Through the Anne Arundel County Police Department's philosophy of community policing, they make residents feel safe and secure at home and improve their quality of life. I support the Police Accountability Board Bill in its current format as detailed in Bill 16-22. Of course, police <clears throat> must be held accountable for any misconduct, but please remember that our men and women in blue our everyday people who put their lives on the line every day to protect us, the vast majority of whom do so with integrity and bravery. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Emma Buckman. Hello, my name is Emma Buckman. I live at 484 White Cedar Lane in Severna Park. Thank you for giving me the chance to speak tonight. Um, I'm here to ask that the County Council amend Bill 1622 to include the recommendations of the Anne Arundel County Coalition for Police Accountability, which includes subpoena powers, paid investigators that can effectively handle the number of complaints that come, and membership that reflects Anne Arundel County populations that have the most interactions with law enforcement, not Anne Arundel County at large. Regardless of the many exemplary officers I'm sure make up the Anne Arundel County Police Department, it is clear that we have a problem with racial bias in Anne Arundel County Police. Unfortunately, I hear from many Anne Arundel County citizens that racism no longer exists, that it was taken care of in the civil rights era, and if systemic racism doesn't exist, then there's no, there are no incidents of racial bias in our law enforcement to worry about, right? If you honestly believe that, then you haven't been paying attention. How many black and brown citizens of our county have stood up here or in the General Assembly or in meetings with elected officials and have said, we experience police brutality, we experience racial bias, we experience life-changing trauma at the hands of the Anne Arundel County Police Department. We know systemic racism exists because it has been told to us by impacted people, shown through cell phone footage by brave bystanders, sorry, and felt in our communities with every loss of a young black or brown person to police violence. Losses like that of Crystal Nelson, a black woman who 
was shot in the back while she was pregnant by Anne Arundel County Police in 1989, or like the very recent shooting of Deontay Quarles Jr. by an Anne Arundel County Police officer. These are the lived experiences of our community members, of our fellow Americans, and every attempt to weaken a police accountability board, every attempt to prevent a board from being able to protect all of our citizens, especially citizens that have been historically impacted by police brutality, is disregarding and disrespecting their voices, their feelings, and their trauma. I implore you to listen to these community voices. Do not ignore the lived experiences of so many of your constituents. Create a strong board that will hold our law enforcement officers to the highest standard and protect those that have been historically impacted by a racist system. Thank you. Thank you very much. This panel is dismissed. I will now call down the next six speakers. Joshua Hatch, Armani Jackson, Juanita Long Osuji, Juanita Myrick, Wesley G. Carter, and Sheriff James Davis. If all of those uh, names, folks that I just called your name, if you could please come down to the table. All right, it looks like maybe some of the folks have left. Um, Mr. Hatch. All right, state your name and address for the record. You have two minutes. Thank you very much. Joshua Hatch, 1856 Bowman Court. <clears throat> There's a lot that I could say about this piece of legislation that raised concern. But at the end of the day, I think it's important to highlight the purpose of this legislation. The purpose of this legislation is to build the trust and the level of accountability that the officers who serve our community daily is to build the relationships of the community that have been negatively and adversely impacted. And I ask this council, the way in which this bill is currently drafted, does it address the community that is underprivileged and un unserved often? And I will say no, it is not. Two things that i like to point out specifically is the membership, one, that I feel like the membership should make up those individuals who are adversely impacted, those individuals who have the most encounters with police, those individuals who are daily abused by officers who decide to um, abuse their authority. Sure, there are a multitude of officers that do their job, but there are a handful of officers who have helped to perpetuate the position that we find ourselves in today. And as this county council discusses whether or not um, we have what it takes so far as to introduce legislation right now to address these things, I'd say that we don't. We need to either scrap the bill or make the necessary amendments that the coalition has uh, recommended. The other thing that I would highlight is the investigatory power of this uh, police accountability board, which is important. We know that the police department historically have hidden information uh, from attorneys from courts. And later on, we find out that individuals were wrongly convicted. Um, this is something that's a concern. So this police accountability board needs the ability to investigate, needs their power to investigate separately from what is being provided by the police department, because no one can guarantee that a police department is going to provide the PAB with the information that they seek. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hatch. Um, and I'm just going to say, why don't you go ahead and state your name and address for the record, since I don't know your name. Yes. Hi, my name is Juanita Myrick. I am the aunt of Kathy Morris. Um, my address is 303 Lori Drive, apartment I, Glen Burnie, Maryland, 21061. Um, what I want to speak about how my my niece, um, excuse me, and I hope I don't hurt uh, hurt anybody's ears. Ah, that's how I felt when I got the news in 2012. Me, and my mother, was in a restaurant, and we fell out. 
and people had to come to our aid. I don't know their names or anything. So my niece's death affect our lives very much. And I see my sister and my brother-in-law who passed away, Kathy's father, has went miles and back to North Carolina, to Maryland, to different people, to police department, to Congress, anybody tried to get help for my niece. I'm telling you, this bill has to be fair. This bill has to be true. This p bill has to help everyone because if you in that position, you just don't know. You just don't know. And I want to end to say this, I never thought my niece commit suicide. I always thought somebody had did something to her. And it took nine years to change from suicide. So I know that she did not commit suicide. So I want this bill to help everyone. I want it to help everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you may proceed. Yes, I'm Randy Curtis. Um, my address is 8269 Quarterfield Road. And I'm reading the testimony of Officer um, Sheriff Jim Davis. Um, I'm going to try to make this within the two minutes. <laughs> um, he was, a, uh, he was um, Officer Davis uh, with over 50 years of experience as a law enforcement professional and who was certified um, and was a certified expert in crime scene investigation. He was one of the lead investigators on behalf of the Morris family. His testimony was critical in the judge ordering the correction to the manner of death for Catherine Morris. Tonight, he is before another counsel testifying, or I'm in his stead, testifying, agreeing with the coalition. Um, he wrote, I have been a private investigator since 2005. I started my law enforcement career in 1968 as a patrol officer in Washington, D.C. Was later recruited in the United States Department of Justice as a marshal, served as an instructor, was recruited in Interpol, and went on to retire from the Department of Justice. I was elected sheriff in Polk County, retiring in 2002. On March 6, 2012, Catherine Morris died. It is my belief that several law enforcement officers failed to properly handle her death investigation and cover-up ensued to cover those errors. I was asked by Reverend Marguerite Morris to assist with the several investigative activities and utilize my extensive background to help both her and her husband without compensation. I reviewed the reports from all the officers, footage from the scene, crime scene photos. The reports described the conduct of the officers on the scene. It talked about the methodology that was used, grills, the charcoal, position of body, all of those descriptive pieces were in, the, in reports. I saw that many mistakes were made. There was tampering with the scene, inadequate protection for the evidence, and a failure to preserve crime scene footage. You may complete your thought. <laughs> in my opinion, the medical examiner failed to properly look for the chemical uh, evidence due to law enforcement mistakes. I'm going to just read this last and for respective time. From a law enforcement perspective, had proper uh, procedures taken place from the initial contact of the officers with the victim, and had they and had they have been done correctly, we may not be here today with the date and place of her death declared unknown in 2020. As a former law enforcement professional, when the family looked for answers to their complaints, it took nine years of a mother's life to be heard. And I'll end with that. Thank you very much. All right, this panel is dismissed. I will be calling down the next six that I have on my list. David Grogan, Dr. Lee Ann Grossberg, Lydia Polk, Erica Scott, Chuck Hurley, and Annie Sanford. You may all come down to the table, please.
you're, you're seated, so why don't you go ahead and start if you're ready. State your name and address for the record. My name is Annie Sandy, uh, excuse me, Sanford, 122 Bonnie View Road, Glen Burnie, 21060. Good evening, County Council. Somewhere on this road of life, you will need to be rescued. Whether you realize it or not, every night be grateful just in case today was that day. This evening, I ask you to remember that the men and women sworn to protect the citizens of Anne Arundel County are our sons and daughters, spouses, parents, neighbors, and coaches. Our officers are part of our village. They are us. Rising prices of food, gas, and daycare also affect them. They're master barbecuers, sing karaoke, and pray with us. Our officers are in the communities building relationships, shooting hoops, playing dodgeball, eating freezy pops. They purchase out of their own pocket clothing, shoes, food, and toys for the young and old in our village of Anne Arundel County. Anne Arundel County officers are a highly trained diverse group undergoing rigorous training to become the finest in their profession. Unlike most of us, potential candidates must initially undergo a polycraft psychological and medical testing, background check of criminal, driving, drug, and credit history, a written exam, physical fitness agility, fingerprinting, and reference checks. Once accepted, training and testing remain throughout their career. They do not have the luxury of a snow day, but are out in all weather helping people that are unable to help themselves. They see the worst of humanity while maintaining their focus and doing their job as rigorously trained professionals. Can you imagine going to work every single day knowing that you might not come home to your family and friends? Please be fair to the noble men and women that willingly walk into danger to save us. The greatest wisdom in a man is to refrain from injuring another when he has the power to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you may proceed. Uh, I'm Chuck Hurley. I'm one of your constituents at uh, Five Park Place in Annapolis uh, itself. Um, I uh, am also a member of the Annapolis Human Relations Commission and am testifying on my behalf and on their behalf. Uh, at our last month's meeting, we had an excellent presentation by Reverend Marguerite Mars, and the commission unanimously uh, supported all seven recommendations of the Anne Arundel uh, uh, coalition on poli uh, police accountability. Uh, I also uh, happen to be a retired uh, national CEO of Mothers Against Drunk Driving, and I want to speak up for some of the good cops, not some of the good cops. I'd like to speak up for good cops uh, specifically and, and share some of the comments that were made. Even though we strongly support this, uh, uh, the, the strengthening of the bill, uh, I've worked with law enforcement across the country, been probably on ride-alongs and checkpoints in maybe 30 states, um, and uh, the good officers are intensely proud that they do their tough and uh, difficult and sometimes dangerous job knowing the full protections of the Constitution that apply to everybody. I mean, in America, we, uh, everyone is created equal and everyone is entitled by the Constitution uh, to uh, equal, the equal treatment uh, by law enforcement. The, the good officers do that. And they do that uh, with, with pride. Um, we, um, and again, you know, it, it, law enforcement is the one that cut drunk driving in half. Matt gets the credit, but the, the people that got the drunks off the road were the law enforcement officers, and we want to uh, thank them for that. But I believe that every time an officer who doesn't respect the Constitution uh, violates the rights of others, he dishonors some of the good, great work that they, the good officers do. And I think by having a, a, a strong uh, accountability board, uh, one that certainly reflects uh, uh, you know, not only strong, fair, independent, and transparent, I believe that will uh, entitle the good officers to get the respect back that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you very much. This, this panel of two is dismissed. Thank you very much. Um, next on my list, I have Tracy D'Angelo. Michael Mattia, Walter, uh, Walter Rodriguez, Amy Cruz, and Marguerite Morris. I have you on here, Reverend Morris, uh, also representing CAST. Where did you intend to speak twice? And uh, William Rao.
Before we begin with this panel, Reverend Morris, it's typical that an individual only speak one time. Are you, is this truly independent testimony for a separate organization? They are two separate organizations. Um, I don't have to be since you called me. I came up. Well, I, I called your name with the intent of asking this question. It's really not uh, usually the practice to have someone speak twice. That's not a problem. And Erica Scott is on her way. She notified you. Okay. Thank you. Um, that would be fine. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, Tracy D'Angelo. My name's Tracy D'Angelo, um, and I'm the vice president for the Southern District PCRC and the public information officer for the PCRC Executive Board. We are very lucky here in Anne Arundel County to have the police department that we do. They are a thriving and visible part of every community in Anne Arundel County. I work in both a private and a public school. The high school SRO has helped my private school with parking issues where students were parking in our small parking lot. At the public school where I also work, I enjoy watching the kids' faces when officers stop by to high five our students arriving at school and help out the staff getting kids out of cars and buses. It's always a treat for everyone to have them there. As a PCRC public information officer, I have seen countless pictures of officers helping with flat tires, toy drives, food banks, and assisted living facilities. The department's youth activities program is taking kids fishing, golfing, bowling, and to baseball games. I joined the group at a local farm trip one day. I love talking with the kids and officers. For a short time, those kids were able to forget their troubles and just be kids. Throughout the lockdowns of 2020, our officers made every attempt to join birthday parades with lights and sirens. They made sure we all knew they were still there with us supporting our communities. We have often talked with officers. I have often talked with officers and enjoy hearing their stories of why they decided to join the police department. Their first response is always to help people. But at the end of the day, they go home where they are husbands and wives and moms and dads just like you and me. They take off that uniform and walk in our communities as neighbors and coaches and friends. As we moved into the uncharted territory of a police accountability board, I hope you will keep all of this in mind. Our police officers are hardworking folks with big jobs and deserve a fair and impartial accountability board. Our Anne Arundel County police officers give us their very best every day and we, in return, must give them must give our best to them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next is Michael Mattia, and apologies if that's not the correct pronunciation. Pronunciation. No, you did very good, thank you. <laughs> My name is Mike Mattia, 108 Oakford Avenue, Edgewater, Maryland. I'm an over 50 year resident of this county, and I'm here in support of this bill. Absolute support of it. No matter what happens, Things in life change, things in life evolve. We've heard testimony of this officer did this, this officer did that years and years ago. Yeah, years and years ago. We have evolved as a department down here. I'm the president of Southern District's Police Community Relations Council and I sit on the executive board as a vice president of this council. Any of you up there know how long this council's been in existence? Anybody but speak up? Over 60 years, you should get involved in it. We are a liaison between the community and the departments. Our doors are open to everybody, regardless of race, creed, religion. It doesn't matter. You come in, you find out what's going on. All right? We build that bridge between the community and the department. Now, I keep hearing testimony about this happened these years ago, this happened these years ago. This department is not the same department it was 50 years ago, 40 years ago, 30 years ago. It's not the same department it was 10 years ago or even five years ago. It constantly evolves. It gets better. It's not getting worse. It is getting better all the time. Like it was stated before, our crisis response team wasn't voted best in the county or best in the state or best in the country. It was voted the best in the world. You don't get that from not evolving. Our department as a whole evolves from the chief on down to that new rookie coming into the academy. They evolve, they learn how to do things right. Now, you can't blame the current administration for what happened years ago. 
An example of that would be if my dad had gone out and raped, robbed, and murdered and get, got sentenced to 100 years in jail and he died after serving 50 years, don't come looking to me to serve his other 50 years. I had nothing to do with that. The officers and staff they have on cue right now were not involved in the stuff that happened years and years ago. Some of those folks have retired. They moved to other agencies. They might have even passed on. Mr. Mattia, I need to ask you to conclude your remarks. Your two minutes has expired. My remarks are this is an absolute number one police department in the country. And it can only evolve and get better. I'm here in support of this bill. The body cameras, I'm in support of that. It's going to take the he said, she said out of what happened. And I thank you for your time. All right. Thank you, Mr. Matia. Next, um, I realize I don't think I have your first name, Ms. Uh, Walter Rodriguez. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, County Council. My name is Lydia Walther Rodriguez, and I am the Region Director with CASA in Central Maryland. And I'm here today with the Anne Arundel County Coalition for Police Accountability. And we will be testifying in opposition of Bill 1622 unless it is amended with the coalition's recommendations. CASA is the largest immigrant rights and services organization in the Mid-Atlantic, with over 4,000 lifetime members here in Anne Arundel County. Our members are working class immigrant families families from Latin America, different countries in Africa, and the Caribbean, who have repeatedly expressed fear and doubt about filing complaints against police officers. I want to uplift the story of David, who was brutalized by police officers in 2018. Officers claim to have been have confused uh, David's identity with someone else and left David hospitalized and his family traumatized during the incident in front of his Annapolis apartment. When David's family reached the hospital that night with David, he felt intimidated after the three officers came to his hospital room. David's case is one of a hundred examples of cases that are abandoned due to police intimidation after misconduct. We cannot continue to have police officers police themselves, and this is why we stood united and fought for the police reforms in the state level, and together won the victory of the Maryland Accountability Act just in 2021. Now that the Police Accountability Boards, PABs, are soon to be implemented here in Anne Arundel County, we stand united as part of the local Police Accountability Coalition, urging county council members amend Bill 1622 to bring about greater police accountability and with these amendments, develop an effective PAB board. We need real civilian oversight in Anne Arundel County and that cannot happen without the suggested amendments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next, Amy Cruz. Thank you. Um, my name is Amy Cruz. I'm a resident of Annapolis uh, County District 6. Um, honored to be represented by the council chair, Lisa Rodvian. Um, and I'm here to uh, express my opposition to the bill unless it's amended with all of the coalition's recommendations. The Coalition for Police Accountability um, is made up of 19 organizations. And those in organizations include civil rights organizations, but also organizations led by directly impacted individuals in our county, um, black-led, Latinx-led, um, and of the people in our, the people and the organizations in our coalition, many are experts at civilian oversight, experts. Um, so I will then introduce myself a little bit, and I will say that I normally don't feel like I'm an expert at anything, but this is something that I feel like I may know as much as anybody else in the room about. So I'm going to speak with a little bit of you know, confidence there. I uh, work for the ACLU of Maryland. I've been there for 22 years with the legal department. Um, I have been on the civilian review board in Baltimore City as a non-voting member for six years. And I've been a member of NACOL, which is the National Association of Civilian Law Enforcement of police officers um, for many years and been to many conferences, attended many seminars along with uh, Reverend Morris, William Rall down the way. I'm glad they're both here. Uh, we have been studying this uh, civilian oversight for a long time, met people from all across the country um, with all different models of oversight. There's no one uh, perfect model, um, but there are things that absolutely need to be um, included in a bill like this in order for um, 
uh, from a best practices stand for, standpoint in order for it to be an effective uh, accountability board. So please use me as a resource outside of today. Most of you have my email and can reach me. Please let me know if you need any examples, national standards, et cetera. And we need to get, get it right. I agree with several people who said earlier, that's already two minutes. All right. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Cruz. Um, let's see. Next we have, oh, William Rowell. Good evening, you all. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak this evening. Um, I, I do, I am a resident of Annapolis and uh, by proxy Anne Arundel County. Um, I, I also, my day job is I, I work um, in government. Um, and I, I did want to, in a way, kind of bring a little of our conversation um, down to earth and and just be very clear that it is it is uh, really a disservice to everyone on all sides for us to so vehemently perceive this legislation as being anti-police. So if, if there's nothing I want you all to hear from me is that what's at the core of police accountability is not saying that police officers and police agencies are doing horrible, terrible things to everyone all the time. I want you to even just think about the idea that in order for the years and years of work that it took to pass legislation at the state level, you would have to imagine that there are people who see that there is an issue. Would you all agree with that? As policymakers, would you all agree that this is an issue that is long overdue, that this discussion? And so whether you answer me or not, um, I think that it's evidence that this is something that is important. So I'm not here to, to uh, particularly in front of you all, take a position. I do want you all, as you go into your chambers, to consider the seriousness and weight of police accountability and the impact that it really has on maybe not people like us, because, and I'll wrap this up, because the truth of the matter is a lot of the ways that we expect people to engage in, in governmental affairs or you know, to practice civil, you know, um, civil engagement has very, very strong barriers and filters that prevent them from engaging in it, such as having to show your ID to get into the building. So, even little things like that, I want you all to consider when you read this and you look at this legislation and you listen to people to consider that it is, it is something that is very, very important when we talk about the democratic process. So I thank you all for giving me time. Thank you, Mr. Rowell, and this panel is dismissed. Um, I will now call the next six um, uh, speakers. Bishop Antonio Palmer, Pastor Stephen Tillett, Kirsten Clark, Ron Wayne, Carl C. Brooks, and Erica Griswold. And Bishop Palmer, when you are ready, you may state your name and address for the record and proceed. You have two minutes. Bishop Antonio Palmer, 8019 Orchard Grove Road. Odeton, Maryland, District 4. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Madam Chair, Council. Um, I'm going to make this very sweet, very quick. Um, I respect all of you. I interact with all of you. I respect our county executive, the great work that you guys are doing. Uh, I highly uh, respect uh, Chief Alwood. Um, we have a police account accountability board bill that's before us. I believe that you all have good hearts. I'm trusting that you would do the right thing, uh, assure the citizens and the residents of our good county uh, that, uh, that we are continuing with the momentum of change and not having uh, any type of 
roll back. Roll back. There you go. There, you know. Roll backs from the change, the positive changes that have been made. Um, I've seen you guys do some good work. Um, don't let politics get in the way. I know it's voting season. Let's just do the right thing. The residents, especially the underrepresented um, residents of our county that are victims of uh, police misconduct, that is prevalent today. We know that. Let's make sure that we have the right kind of police accountability board. Um, and uh, so I oppose the way that is written now because I just feel like it's incomplete uh, and that it should be fine-tuned or some recommendations from the coalition uh, that we have put together. So God bless you and have a good, good night. Thank you very much. Um, Reverend Stephen Tillett, or here it says pastor, so pastor, reverend. You have it. <laughs> so whatever, whatever you like. <laughs> Good evening. Stephen Tillett, pastor of Asbury Broadneck United Methodist Church, 657 Broadneck Road in Annapolis. I live in Severn, um, District 1, and came today as a member of the executive committee of the Anne Arundel County Branch NAACP. Accountability is defined as the quality or state of being accountable. It is especially an obligation or willingness to accept responsibility or to account for one's actions. In my 20-year career as an Air Force officer, one of the functional ironies of the UCMJ, Uniform Code of Military Justice, was the insistence that the person with an issue or complaint had to file their concern through their chain of command. If the chain of command was functioning appropriately, in theory, that wasn't a problem. If it was not, the person who was making a complaint was at a huge disadvantage because they were complaining in a chain of command that had shown it did not care about them or their complaints or the abusive and toxic environment in which they worked. In so many other career fields, people are held accountable either by their peers or often by people outside of their career field for bad behavior or mistakes that they make. My wife is a physician. They have boards that oversee the work of physicians, the errors that physicians make, and it includes civilians in that oversight. The police, who are granted with essentially life and death authority, should not be allowed to function any differently. They must be held accountable to the highest standards of professional conduct and responsibility and should not be allowed to hide behind qualified immunity, a silent blue wall, or anything else that inhibits justice and accountability. No career field is impervious to bad actors, be it police work, ministry, education, medicine, or any other career field. In each instance, there must be the highest level of accountability that can operate outside of peer pressure and codes of silence. We urge you to amend Bill 16-22 because Anne Arundel County needs significantly greater police accountability, not because we assume officers are wrong, but just in case they are. Thank you. Uh, Kirsten Clark. Good evening, County Council. Uh, my name is Kirsten Clark. I'm on representing the Center of Help located at 1906 Forest Drive in Annapolis. The Center of Help is a nonprofit. Our mission is to empower, educate, and connect immigrants with resources to promote self-sufficiency and to advocate for the successful integration of the immigrant community into Anne Arundel County and the surrounding areas. Just last year, the Center of Help conducted listening sessions with families in Annapolis regarding interaction with police officers. We were surprised to find that while parents trusted the officers and believed they would protect the children, many of the youth who had experienced encounters with police themselves expressed deep fear, not regarding consequences of their actions, but regarding the actual interaction with the officer. Clients have also brought to our attention many cases where excessive use of force was a concern. Unfortunately, they're unwilling to make a formal report because they do not trust the system to protect them. Just last year, we had a case where a client was re-hospitalized after use of force uh, shortly after surgery, and he was sent back to the hospital. He chose not to report and not to pursue the reporting of this against the officer because he does not trust the system. We know that the Latino population is 
disproportionately affected, although the data is often skewed and obscured because of the lines between race and ethnicity. It is your duty as elected officials to ensure the safety of all county residents. That includes police accountability. For this reason, on behalf of the Center of Health, we urge you to amend the bill 1622 based on the recommendations made by the Anne Arundel County Coalition for Police Accountability and protect our black and brown communities in Anne Arundel County. Thank you very much. Next is Ron Wayne. I'd like to thank the, uh, the council for giving me this opportunity to speak on this particular bill. My name is Ron Wayne. I'm an executive board president of the Police Community Relations Council, the PCRC of Anne Arundel County. I've had the pleasure of serving on the PCRC for several years and find that our county police department and its members have demonstrated why they have been credited with being one of our nation's best police departments. The four PCRCs, one for each district, meet with county police, residents, and elected officials each month. These open to the public meetings are well attended. During the recent pandemic, meetings again open to the public were held virtually. These meetings provide a platform for exchanging ideas, concerns, information, and explaining new laws between the residents, police, and elected officials. Our police officers become more than law enforcers. They are friends, neighbors, counselors, and information resources. I have witnessed when officers are moved between districts due to promotion, diversity, and lost due to retirements, how it affects some of the residents. They feel they have lost a friend and sometimes more. I continue to observe how these officers are involved in community events, many of which are initiated by the officers and are designed especially for youth involvement. Because of my allotted time, I cannot give examples of all the activities our police officers are involved. I can't express how much these officers mean to our residents. A recent evaluation took place of our county police departments with this relationship to communities resulted in a top rating. I invite the members of the county council to be a frequent attendee at these PCRC meetings to personally see how well the police, elected officials, and community members interact. Anne Arundel County Police has been blessed with one of the nation's best police departments and it should be treated and rewarded accordingly. I ask when the Police Accountability Board candidates are selected that they are selected on the basis of meeting requirements, not the requirements being modified to meet a candidate. I also find it interesting that Bill number 1622 is being introduced with 22 amendments. 22 amendments. Again, I thank you. Thank you very much. Next, um, Carl. One other item, please. Oh, very quickly, because your two minutes have expired. <laughs> Since 1987 through 2021, a total of only 494 citizen and internal complaints have been filed against our county police. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, Carl Brooks. Good evening. My name is Carl Brooks. I reside at 308 Columbus Road, Glen Burnie, Maryland. I am the president of Northern District PCRC. In 1965, I became a member of the Cedar and Mars Hill Improvement Association. In 1966, Anne Arundel County sent letters to community associations asking for volunteers to take part in a group called Police Community Relations Council. In 1967, first meeting was held at police headquarters. With citizens' input, the council was told, was voted on, and I became a member. Over the years of changes, over the years, a lot of changes have taken place in law enforcement. Just to name two, body cameras and police reform. Society's attitude and activities has also changed. I would like the county council to be mindful of the changes that have come about were not generated in Anne Arundel County, but other jurisdictions. I have in support, I am in support of Bill 1622. When elected officials is sworn in, they become public servants. I think there is first, their first response should be quality of life for every citizen. That would also include law enforcement officers and the family of law enforcement officers. With proper tools and support, they will make quality of life a reality. And before I say thank you, I just want to add that at any time, 
you'd like to come to Northern District, and I will have the arrangements so you can do a ride around or a ride along with the Anne Arundel County Police Department. And if you would ride down on, as you know, Northern District butts up against Baltimore City. If you want a tense moment and seem like your life is on the line, you ride one of them officers. I've done that. When you have to pull people over, it is very, very dangerous. But those officers do their job on the line all the time. I thank you. Thank you very much. And the last speaker for this panel is Ms. Griswold. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Um, my name is Erica Griswold, and I am a resident of uh, Anne Arundel County. And I am here today in, solidar in solidarity, I'm sorry, with my community and as a advocator of the people and accountability. Um, just like Reverend uh, Morris said and, and, and Mr. Rao, this is not about saying that the police are bad. I am not anti Police. I come from a police family. My dad is a retired police officer. Um, so I am not anti-police. However, I am anti-bad police who abuse their power. I feel, just like a lot of you, I believe, that people should be held accountable for their actions. Period. Let's go over the data, shall we? Data is very important. The data says that population for black and brown communities in Anne Arundel County is 26.4%. Black and brown communities make up 56.4% of total searches. They make up 51% of all total arrests. Black and brown communities make up 41.82% of all total tra traffic stops in Anne Arundel County. 21% of those traffic stops were more than five minutes. So just do the math. I am not anti-police, just like I said. I am anti-bad police, and everyone should be held accountable for their actions. So I am just saying to make this bill matter, just like you make everything else matter that you care about. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much to each of the members of this panel. You are dismissed. And we have three names left on my list. Um, Reverend Ricky Jones, Monica Alvarado, and Kathy Fleshman. You may come down to the table. And when it's your turn, you may state your name and address for the record. And you have two minutes. And Reverend Jones, since you're first on the list, you may begin when you are ready. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable members of the council, good evening. Uh, Reverend Ricky Nelson Jones, I'm a civil rights attorney out of Baltimore and Columbia, Maryland, and I'm here representing the NWCP. I'm the second vice president of the NWCP for Anne Arundel County. Whenever any legislation <clears throat> has any provision that counters the law from which it derives, it must be amended. I've submitted to you in writing eight things that the NWCP, NWCP believes should to be incorporated to amend this bill. Let me start off with this, as I only have two minutes. Let me go to the heart of this matter. One thing that counters the law, the Police Accountability Act of 2021, is 3-78103A1. This is the section in which we give the, uh, the county executive decide to have 14 people on the Police Accountability Board. Five of them are ex-official members. Three of the ex-official members are police officers. The bill is crystal clear. There are to be no active police officers on the Police Accountability Board. So this, so this bill seems to, so to speak, indirectly and in a slick way, put active police officers on the Police Accountability Board. The legislature already considered this. They knew that was a bad idea. Law enforcement has demonstrated they are incapable of policing themselves. So we have an independent body here, board, so we can have some fair and just um, evaluation of what police officers are doing. Keep this in mind. Even though the bill is very clear about we must make sure that there is um, racial, gender, and cultural diversity on the board. That's important, but that's not the most important thing. 
The most important thing is that the majority of the members on the Police Accountability Board come from the community that has had frequent interaction with law enforcement many times unfavorably. If you do not have the majority of the members on the Police Accountability Board and the Administrative Charging Committee from the community, we're going to have the same old, same old. People are going to still, they're not going to trust the process. So when you have the majority of people from the community and then a police officer is exonerated, the, the community can, so to speak, be at peace a little bit. So they must be the majority on the board. I've given you in writing the eight points, so I feel comfortable stopping now, and I ask that all of those points be incorporated. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, Monica Alvarado. I was going to say I don't see her here unless there's someone by the same name. Um, so next on my list is Kathy Fleshman. Whoops. Is that on? Okay. You need mics for short people. <laughs> my name is Kathy Fleshman. I live at 1280 Myers Station Road, Edmonton, Maryland. Um, I am here tonight in favor of the Police Accountability um, Bill, number 1622. I sit on the Western District Police Community Relations Council and have come to realize over the years just how blessed this county is to have such dedicated officers who are tr well trained and go above and beyond to serve the citizens of this county to the best of their ability. They don't have an easy job in one split second when responding to an emergency call, things can go very bad very quickly. They put their lives on the line every day. They and their families sacrifice a lot so that we, the citizens of this county, can stay safe. Um, as you have seen, this bill is quite extensive. There's a lot to it. And I think with some amendments, it can be made a better bill. Um, there are bad officers, but there are a lot of good officers as well. So it's very important that our officers, as well as our citizens, are all treated fairly in matters that come before that board. Hopefully this bill will produce a set of reg regulations and rules that will work in the best interest for both citizens and for our police officers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so the members of this panel are dismissed. And um, you may stay at the table, because I will go ahead and say if there's anyone else in the audience here who wishes to speak, um, you're dismissed, Ms. Flashman. Thank you very much. Um, if there's anyone else in the audience who wishes to speak, um, now you may come down um, and take a seat at the table. And um, we will start um, with... Our guest who's already here, you're, I, I'm embarrassed. If I know you, I don't recognize you with your mask on. So <laughs> state, your name and okay. state your name and address for the record, and you have two minutes. Uh, my name is Erica Scott. You called me earlier. It's OK. I was on my way from college. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, my name is Erica Scott, and I am a volunteer uh, and a member of CAST, Community Actively Seeking Transparency. On 2015, the Anne Arundel County Police wrote an incident report that only provided inaccurate that it provided inaccurate information. The report omitted information. I sent my complaint to the supervisor of the officers. Based on his communication with the officers who wrote the report, there was information that was omitted. The supervisor felt that a decision to discuss this with the officers was enough and provided no effective solution to the inaccurate reports. I filed a complaint with AACP Internal Affairs, and based on the response, the report was not amended. I later reached out to the Office of Professional Standards and the lieutenant stated that they had completed a thorough investigation on their fellow officers. However, they had not spoken with everyone they should have. The investigation that was said to have happened did not appear to be reasonable. The inaccurate report had a serious impact on judicial matters and as of today has not been given an unbiased thorough review and amendment. Inaccurate reports affect communities and its families. It affects the health of a community and families. I support the bill. I support the bill and I support the Police Accountability Board um, amendments and final edits that came from the Anne Arundel County Coalition. It's the public's health that is being affected. Why not start making a change for the better now? Thank you. Thank you very much. And I will go from left to right. So you may go next. That's fine. All the, comp all, all the information is going back and forth. I'm with the Western District PCRC. Um, 
and I've had good experiences with the officers. I've had bad. Uh, a good one was when my brother was killed in an auto accident. The officers were sympathetic. Uh, there was another one where there was a murder in Glen Burnie, and a family member was involved in that, and one of the officers made, it, officers made a comment, well, that's okay, he just killed a piece of scum, which was completely inconsiderate. You know? but, with everything going on, everybody's human. They say things they don't always mean. We, that matter was taken care of. But overall, uh, everything that all the, for, for the most part, every experience I've had with the officers have been positive. You know, I've, I've had an incident where I was in an accident and one of the officers refused to, to cite the, uh, the driver and it kind of caused a, a big legal battle for me. But Everything that they've done positive outweighs the negative. I mean, people, they say things they don't always mean. Things are said in a way that is taken differently than it should. The context is, is wrong. Um, but I support this bill, and I support our officers. Um, as far as diversity, we have a, a black chief. We have black officers. We have female officers. We have a diversity of all, all races. Miss Lacey here knows the PCRC. We honor the, the officers with merit awards. We do everything we can to support the officers. And that's what the officers need. They need support. They don't need people fighting with them and, and arguing with them. I have three kids. I'll be honest. All three of my kids have had illegal issues. But every officer that had dealt with my kids have come back and said, OK, yes, your, your child did wrong. but." They complied. They did everything that we asked them to do. And that's all we can do is ask our kids to be respectful of these officers because they want to go home at nighttime. And the family members want them to go home. Just like if my, my, did, my son did something wrong, you know, I expect him to own up and, and face what he did. But cut it short, I, um, I'm sorry for the people who lost their children. I know losing a family member is hard. I've lost eight family members in the past few years. I lost my parents within 36 hours of each other. But, you know, life goes on. But I support this bill, and I, I'm thankful to be able to go home at nighttime. And if I have a problem, I can pick up the phone and call the police, and I know they're going to come, and they're going to support me. Thank you. Thank you. And our next speaker. Hi, Sta good evening, everyone. Uh, Your name and address for the record, please. My name is Victor Smith. I live at 7704 Winnowood Court, Severn, Maryland. And I'm here to support the bill tonight, and this is the reason why. We should be applauding our officers every single day. They put their life on the line every single day. Now, are there some errors in judgment? Sure, without a doubt. But I walk the streets of Annapolis every day mentoring kids at the Alita YMCA. And I have officers walking the streets with me in Brooklyn Park, Walk, walking with me in Laura, Maryland, walk with me in Annapolis. We just did a love walk because people are killing people out here, and that is true life. So now we want to take people that interact with the police every single day, and then we want to say that they want to be on a board, and that's supposed to be fair to the officers? No, not at all. We're going to take people that are going to have a pin them in the middle. It's not going to swing this way. It's not going to swing that way because accountability is fairness and fairness is in the middle. We will not treat our officers like that. That is unjust. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker. Good evening. My name is Lynn Fitzpatrick and I live in Galesville, which is part of District 7. And I am a white woman who has championed diversity, equity, and inclusion for over a decade, and I have several letters after my last name. On August 20th, 2021, I was found not guilty of a crime. Neither I nor a single witness had to testify on my behalf. In making his ruling, the district court judge stated that the criminal court was not used to ruling in such matters, which was a civil matter, and that there was no color of theft or guilt on my part. Every agency from the Annapolis Police Department, the commissioner of the court, to the state's attorney's office mishandled the case. I have not expunged the record because I called for internal investigations to be initiated by the Annapolis Police Department, the state's attorney's office in August of 2022, 2021. 
as I expressed in my complaints, my hope was that what happened to me would never happen to anyone else. I have not expunged the record so that I could continue to enable the investigation. Upon completing its investigation, the state's attorney's office changed the way that it teaches its paralegals to acquire discovery. The misjustice originated from an officer in the Annapolis Police Department. There was no oversight of the officer's actions as he enabled a closed civil matter to escalate to a criminal charge. Miscommunication among the various agencies resulted in my case being heard without me having, to, having received discovery that had been requested numerous times. The Annapolis Police Department's investigation went nowhere from the end of August 2021 through the end of the year, despite my having asked for multiple updates. Since complaining to directly to Rhonda McCoy, professional standards manager of the Annapolis Police Department in February 2022, I have been kept apprised of the progress. I shouldn't have to point this out, but not only do I have a grievance with the way the initial incident was ha ha handled by the Annapolis Police Department, I also find fault with the bias and sloppy handling of charging documents and discovery by multiple agencies, as well as a difficulty in getting an internal investigation initiated and completed. I need you to conclude right. your remarks. So not only do I support strengthening this bill, um, but also making sure that what's well, that um, we consider the coalition's recommendations and make sure that we have something that's good for the greater good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is David Scambalone. I live at 889 Forest Lane in Hanover, Maryland. This community is very important to me. In fact, I am running for county council in District 2. But today I'm here to testify uh, on this bill. Uh, there are two problems with the bill that currently stands. One is, as mentioned by some other testifiers, the board needs independent authority to conduct investigations to make sure it is complied with. Uh, the second one is that, as currently drafted, the county executive has a lot of authority in both appointing and removing members from the board, effectively giving him control of the composition. Since this board is meant to be a check on the executive branch, that's a very bad idea. Uh, and I think he, he, the county executive should be minimally involved, if involved at all, in the composition of this board. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Waddy. Hello, my name is Stephen Waddy. I live at 7968 Heather Miss Drive, and I do support the mask mandate. Um, if you all have any questions in regards to uh, the coalition's uh, recommendations, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, we do support having the uh, membership um, reflect the community, especially those who may be um, returning citizens that have you know, paid their debt to society. Um, we also support making sure that this is a, a, a that the state law is seen as a floor and not the ceiling. We've seen that um, PowerPoint uh, also edited several times. It's you know just it doesn't totally it didn't totally reflect what the law said when we first received it, and um, we believe that like I said the state law. That, that you all may be um, hearing about from the Office of Law is is also um, something to be seen as a floor and not the ceiling to this uh, to this law. And so we do support um, Councilwoman Lacey and Ravian's um, amendments to the bill that would uh, improve the oversight capacity of the Police Accountability Board and provide it with the investigatory powers that are necessary to uh, provide a, a, a complete oversight um, of of what administrative charging committees are performing and even with the, the, the documents that may be received from um, law enforcement agencies. And I also want to say that the, the data that we talked about that you heard previously in regards to traffic stops also reflects data on the students that were arrested by Anne Arundel County Police Department in the school system. It was overly uh, ninth grade black boys with, uh, with learning disabilities who were the, in Anne Arundel County had the largest number of arrests in the state. This is before um, it was revealed in the Capitol Gazette that, that, that arrests were taking place. As you know, in Mead High School was the number one uh, area of arrest in the state. So those were in school arrests. Uh, it also reflects, uh, the, I guess, the Sheriff's Department also will be under this um, Police Accountability Board. The Sheriff's Department was um, uh, had something called the, the, the uh, it was, they were collecting the taxes of people who have warrants. And the majority of people who have warrants 
um, which they most likely received from being pulled over disproportionately, um, were uh, African Americans. And so their tax refunds were being collected. And uh, we, we fought that and were able to um, get the state legislature to, uh, to ban the, the, the confiscation of uh, tax refunds. Mr. Wadi, Thank I you. need to ask you to conclude your two minutes. Appreciate are up. you. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, thank you to this group of speakers. Um, you are dismissed. And at this time, if there is anyone else who would like to speak, um, you may come down to the table and have a seat. And And it looks like we have maybe one more seat still. If there's anyone else that's thinking about coming, you could come on down. All right, let, we can go ahead and get started. I'll start on my left here. Go ahead. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, David Dull, 534 for Heavy, Heavy Tree Hill, Silver Park, Maryland, 21146. Um, Libertarian Party platform, 1.7, crime and justice. Government uh, force must be limited to the protection of the rights of the individual to life, liberty, and property, and government must never be permitted to violate these rights. Laws should be limited to their application of violent or uh, violations of the rights of others through force or fraud, or to deliberate actions that place others involuntarily at significant risk or harm. Therefore, we favor the repeal of all laws creating uh, uh, crimes without victims, such as gambling, the use of drugs for medical or recreational purposes, and the consensual transactions involving sexual services. We support uh, restitution to the victim to the fullest degree possible to, at the expense of the criminal or the ne negligent uh, wrongdoer. The constitutional rights of criminally accused, including due process, a speedy trial, legal counsel, trial by jury, and the legal presumption of innocence until proven guilty must be preserved. We assert the common law right of juries to judge not only the facts, but also uh, the justice of the law. We oppose the prosecu uh, prosecutorial practice of overcharging in criminal prosecutions so as to avoid jury trials by intimidating defendants into accepting plea deals or plea bargains. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a precedent set in 1215. It's called the Magna Carta. Uh, the King of England granted the right of a trial to all English citizens. If the police are able to investigate themselves, if they conduct misconduct, that prevents an individual, whether guilty or not, from going to trial. We are violating 800 years of Western civilization practice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Holt. Okay. Hi, uh, everybody. Thanks for your service. My name is Arthur Holt. I live at 8 Fisk Circle in Annapolis. Um, I'm, I'm here in support of the bill, the police accountability bill, as amended, uh, uh, as recommended by the Coalition for Police Accountability here in Anaconda County. I'd like to do a, just a quick uh, kind of a demographic um, exercise with you. Um, if, if we had 90, 90 school kids, junior high, and, well, middle school and high school, that, um, <clears throat> that were to come into the room, uh, in proportion to the residents of Anne Arundel County, uh, generally speaking, uh, 70 of them, if it were just white and black, 70 of them would be white and 20 of them would be black. That is kind of representative in general of the county with respect to black, black kids and white kids. Um, now, if, if all of a sudden we were, uh, uh, we were to say, okay, now, we're, now we are the, the, the juvenile court. Okay, and we're going to have the, the room with people, with kids who are actually placed under the juvenile court system. We would ask 50 of those white people to leave, 50 of the white kids to leave, and 50 black kids to come in. And so the makeup would be, the makeup would be the exact opposite. And you'll see I, I submitted a, uh, submitted a, uh, this uh, this chart from an Anne Arundel County, you know, from a study that the county did, uh, and this statistic was from 2017, that 69 percent of the kids uh, placed 
in the juvenile justice system were black and uh, for this 22% were white. Okay, so that just gives you a picture of those 50 black children coming in and they're placed. So I, I believe that that, uh, that that imbalance with respect to uh, black and white needs to be addressed and represented on the Police Accountability Board. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Holt. Hi, I'm Chrissy Holt. I'm the state chair of our Revolution Maryland. We represent about 10,000 Marylanders, 500 of which here live in Anne Arundel County. My testimony is to express opposition to Bill 1622. And it definitely needs the amendments and the inclusions of what the Coalition of the Police Accountability Board has recommended. We're here because of the state law. They decided that police can't police themselves. All of the data is there to support that we need subpoena powers and we need paid investigators here locally to um, provide honest communication and investigations. The voting board members need to consist of the community members here. And the data proves that in Anne Arundel County in 2020, that 43% of the people were stopped by the county police department were black and Hispanic, while they only make up 26.7% of the county population. These clear disparate numbers mean that that population needs to be on this board to represent themselves. And as a white woman, you know, I'm not afraid when my children leave the house. And we need to call out the fact that we have seven white people that are going to make this decision about how many black voices and Hispanic voices are on the panel. So when we acknowledge that the dismissal of these positions, provisions to add the African American voices to the board is going to be decided by all white people. And that members of the county council have proven in the past that with your voting behaviors that you don't favor equity. And that you actively have supported racism by promoting white supremacy structures, like when you tried to negate the importance of critically teaching racism and white supremacy structures in American history here in Anne Arundel County. So you've already proven that you don't believe in equity. And at this point, we need to have a fair voice on the council. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Atato. Hello, Phil Atato, 1800 Poplar Avenue in Annapolis. Uh, thank you to those on the council who met with coalition members already. Seems to me like you need to scrap this bill and start from scratch, this time actually listening to the input from the Police Accountability Coalition and marginalized communities. The executive was advised by his attorney that the state laws, the maximum powers the PAB can have. However, the ACLU expert on everything policing feels that is the minimum. If this bill passes, even with the amendments, it seems like it will be doing the absolute least, which will become evident when compared to other counties' bills. Police cannot police themselves. They have showed us this time and time again. We've seen what happens when police are given free reign with the Gun Trace Task Force and Baltimore City Police, and crime there was still rampant. More power and less oversight for police is not the answer. And there are many former Baltimore police officers here in Anne Arundel and Annapolis, so be naive to think that none of the culture from Baltimore City has made its way here. A captain in a recent police community relations meeting said, protect and serve. We're doing a pretty good job protecting. How can we serve? This is how. If police truly serve us, they should have no problem being held accountable by those they serve. Serve by being accountable to those that are most marginalized in our communities, that they have the duty and service to our community to treat with the utmost care and concern. And while I'm not a trained law enforcement officer, I don't need to be one to know how I want to be treated as a member of the community. The accountability is especially important to me as a creative First Amendment activist. I found police use leverage of knowing most people don't want to get arrested to violate rights and gain compliance. So police not being accountable is extremely concerning. It does not bode well for nonviolent methods of creating change, which is required for our government to change to better serve our communities. Keep in mind, police have been on the wrong side of every mass movement in history that has made this country better. Origins of slave patrols, strike breakers, and private property defenders through lines that echoes to today. This history continues with arresting and brutalizing suffragettes, civil rights advocates, LGBTQIA, Native Americans, disabled Americans, and anti-war groups, and the list goes on, including 
including the protests from 2020. Get on the right side of history. And to give you some self-awareness, you're an all-white council and executive, again, telling marginalized communities who are screaming that the house is on fire, that there's nothing to see here and everything is fine. That has not gone well historically. Chief Alwood said that it, uh, Anne Arundel Police Department is the gold standard for police departments. Let's continue that trend to be the gold standard. We have access to experts and examples from around the country to learn from. Strong PAB is how you repair the relationship with communities. We had record numbers of people on the streets nationwide and locally. The community has spoken. The question is, are you listening? This is a historical moment. Your voting re records are what will be your legacy. It's not radical what we're asking for. Get on the right side of history. You know how to find us to further this conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the final member of this panel. Uh, hello, everyone. My name's Eugene Shepard. I'm a resident of Frederick County. and. Um, a father to who, two young black boys that I sung to before I came in here. And the reason why I made this trip is I don't want them to have the same experiences that um, I have. And to be honest, I really didn't always know what was the problem. You know, I grew up really believing after the civil rights movement, things were good. That's pretty much what we were taught. And then, you know, I became a certain age. And then I was working and getting arrested because I was told somebody wearing a white T-shirt, even though mine was beige, just robbed somebody and I'm uh, handcuffed and I got all these cops circling around me and all kinds of stuff. They let me go and told me I was lucky. Um, then I was, um, I was beaten up while handcuffed and I asked the officer, why are you doing this to me? He said, because I hate you. Um, the last time I gave this testimony, I broke down. Um, most recently, um, um, in Whole Foods, eating my lunch that I purchased, and I have a receipt, and I was told that um, I stole my food. They wouldn't believe me, even though I have the receipt. They never asked for it. When I I asked the officer for help, they arrested me. I watched the huddle up. I watched the huddle up when they were trying to decide what to do, what story to go ahead and tell, you know. Fortunately, um, there was an African-American judge who looked at all the evidence and decided to dismiss it. But let that have been somebody who didn't have interests at heart. It already cost me thousands of dollars, my car and so much other stuff, but I guess I was lucky. Thank you very much for sharing your experience. Um, this panel is dismissed. At this time, we can still call additional speakers if there are those in the audience that would like to come down. Come to the table, state your name and address for the record, please. And you have two minutes. And I will continue my pattern of going left to right just for consistency's sake. You may begin. State your name and address, and you have two minutes. My name is Danny Gibbons. I live in Friendship, Maryland. My husband has been a police officer with Anne Arundel County Police for more than 10 years. In those years, I've had the privilege of witnessing officers who genuinely care for their community, quietly carrying out acts of kindness and bravery, despite being put in difficult situations that often have no easy solution. I understand that many people have strong feelings about law enforcement officers, and I know that we are bombarded with headlines intentionally written to draw outrage and fear, but I'm here to ask you to have an open mind. I want to ask you to be willing to engage directly with the officers, go on ride-alongs, listen to their stories, and hear the ideas that they have to improve the neighborhoods they patrol. Mostly, I just want you to know the officers care. I have seen an officer buy warm clothes for a shoplifter, after he was caught stealing a sweatshirt and socks in the middle of winter. The officer used his own money. He didn't post it on social media because he didn't want to embarrass the person that he was helping. He just cared. I've seen officers follow up with crime victims on their day off. I've seen them buy food for kids while they wait for social services and try to distract them from the office and traumatizing situations they're in. I've seen my husband come home crying after a little boy was killed in a car accident because a man was high on heroin and hit him. My husband slept on the floor of our son's room that night. He comes home hangry, angry, 
and hangry sometimes <laughs> when some of our part of our government doesn't do what it should have to prevent a person from being in crisis. He feels people's hopelessness when they don't have good options for drug addiction, treatment, and mental health care, especially when that means that their actions lead to an arrest. Despite those challenges, every night he puts on his uniform and he does his best to protect others. I go to sleep and I hope he comes home in the morning. I, I'm there to hear his struggles and remind him that he can't perform miracles no matter what some people might expect him to do. I'm here before you so incredibly proud of my husband and our, and our friends. They're not demons. They're made of blood and fresh and tears and they just are like the rest of us. They need your support and I hope that they have it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Shire. Good evening. My name is Mike Shire. Uh, I've been a police officer for 18 years. I'm a board member of the Anne Arundel County Fraternal Order of Police, a graduate of University of Maryland Law School, proudly. I've lived in this county for more than 20 years. I, like so many police officers that served this community, took this job to help those that we live around and live with. We took this job to make this a safer place for everybody we care about. I have a family who loves me and worries whether I'll come home from work every day. I would have never imagined the ill will when I took this job that's being inflicted upon our profession. I understand and I sympathize with the communities who feel neglected by their government. I, like so many officers, have spent a career trying to help those communities fight back against the evils that prey on them. Too often, it is only the police officers in these communities across our country that are serving them and trying to help them. I'm going to say that again. Too often, it is only the police officers that are in these communities trying to help them and uplift them and make their lives better. We've taken an oath, a solemn vow, to protect the constitutional rights of all people. And we take that promise to heart every day that we put our uniform on and even the days that we're off duty in our communities. There's no doubt that there are police officers who break that oath. They're bad actors in every profession. They should be held accountable, and some should be ejected from our profession. But American due process relies on ensuring that we don't prejudge anyone. Justice, including judging police officers' actions after the fact, relies on objective, unbiased determinations of facts and circumstances. We must be careful not to paint any group as a whole based on the actions of individual members of that group. I'm very proud of my agency and its high standards. We strive every day to improve the lives of the citizens around us, improve our standards, and make life better for everybody we greet. I agree with the gentleman who said that this should not be anti-police legislation. We achieve that by ensuring that our, promises, that our processes are fair, unbiased, and balanced. There is no perfection in humanity or anything that humanity creates, but we must strive towards creating compromises that fulfill our common goals, our mutual values, and the ideals of constitutional, constitutional due process that upholds our society. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the next gentleman, I don't know your name, but you may proceed. Good evening. I'm Stanley Newborn, and I'm a board member with the Anne Arundel County Police Fraternal Order of, I'm sorry, the Fraternal Order of Police. Um, and I've been a police officer here in Anne Arundel County for 13 years. Uh, I am here today to ask you to build our county a fair and unbiased process for the creation of the Police Accountability Board and the disciplinary process for the police officers in our county. I can speak with pride about my fellow officers uh, here in the county, and I put our agency up against any other agency in the entire country um, for the professionalism that we have, the bravery, and the skills that we uh, have obtained. Um, we have a world-class police, uh, world-class community uh, relations officer. Um, we have the best criminal and traffic investigators and an internationally recognized uh, crisis intervention team. Uh, I reject the notion that the legislation would restore trust because when we say that we need to restore trust, we imply that the trust was lost and I simply don't believe the citizens of Anne Arundel County as a whole do not trust the police department or our officers. The police officers of our agency do not need to earn back what we have not lost, but we strive day in and day out to maintain relationships that continue to build more trust between our police officers and our communities. We, the police officers of the Arundel County, uh, welcome the input and advice the uh, Police Accountability Board will provide, and we are confident that this council, backed by the citizens of this county, will create fair and unbiased and equitable process for accountability to the citizens we proudly serve, and we thank you for your efforts and support. 
Thank you very much. And Mr. Atkinson. Yes, good evening. My name is Corporal O'Brien Atkinson. I'm the president of the Anne Arundel County Fraternal Order of Police. In my 21 years as FOP president, I have had a front row seat to the disciplinary process of our officers. And I am confident that our agency and our county takes holding their officers accountable very, very seriously. As part of my duties, I've also made certain that officers accused of misconduct are provided with due process. To have, a, to have such a system, you need objective, unbiased participants. You need people who will listen to the facts and apply rules to those facts to reach a just decision. We believe that this legislation is aimed at doing just that. We have concerns about some parts of this legislation that we hope will be addressed through the amendment process. Justice requires fairness, and fairness requires thoughtfulness, understanding, and objectivity. Trust is built on a willingness to be fair and be just in your actions and decisions. As much as people must trust their police officers, the police officers must trust the people who have empowered them. And it is a great power police officers are given. The power to detain and arrest, to restrict the freedom of movement that we hold so dear in our free country is given to police officers, along with a trust that it will only be used when the people, through their constitution and laws, have authorized that power to be exercised. We believe that this legislation should create a board vetted through the political process and composed of citizens willing to step forward and make careful, analytical, and impartial decisions with the interest of continuing to do or continuing to allow our police departments to be the best we can be. We cannot allow a system to be created that vilifies the good work of our police officers. Our profession feels the effect that that creates. Applications to be police officers in Anne County are down 80 to 90 percent. Academy classes have fallen from 40 to 50 recruits to now as low as eight. We have to work together towards common goals of a well-trained police force and an understanding public. Now more than ever, people are interested in what makes our police department what it is, and we want it to be the best police department in the country, and we strive to that end. So thank you. Thank you very much. This panel is dismissed, and at this time I will make one final call for any speakers who would like to come and testify. Seeing no movement in the audience at this time, um, the, the public hearing on Bill 16-22 is now closed. Madam Secretary, please read the title of Bill number 16-22. Bill number 1622, an ordinance concerning police accountability board. Thank you very much. Um, at this time, we are going to shift into a mo uh, amendments, but I would ask my colleagues if we could take maybe a five, 10 minute recess. Could I have a motion to take, let's say a 10 minute recess? So moved. Thank you, is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Looking at my clock, the time is 9.23. We will resume at 9.33. We'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes. Have a good bath and lunch.
I worry about that for you. What are you going to do to keep this? Good morning. <laughs> I'm afraid it's going to go fast. Good evening again, everyone. We'd like to get our session back underway. Yeah. Sorry to alarm my colleagues with a loud gavel. <laughs> All right, at this time we're going to go into um, our amendments, and we do have quite a number, so I'm just going to um, pray upon my colleagues to keep remarks as brief as possible, um, because it is already 9, f oh, this clock is fast, 9.40, and um, we, we do have about six items on the agenda after this bill. So, with that said, Madam Secretary, please read amendment number one. I should have asked if you were ready. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. Amendment, it's an easy one. Amendment number one. This technical amendment corrects typographical errors to state law references and other terms. This is an administration amendment. Mr. Barron, would you like to make a brief statement? Uh, very brief. Uh, the uh, Madam Administrator hit the nail on the head. These are typographical errors. All right. Um, is there a motion to adopt? Motion to adopt. Councilman Peruski. Second. Second. Allison Pickard. Um, any additional discussion? I'm going to assume no. Madam Secretary, please call the roll on amendment number one. Ms. Lacey. Aye. Ms. Pickard. Aye. Mr. Volke. Aye. Mr. Prusky. Aye. Ms. Fiedler. Aye. Ms. Hare. Aye. Ms. Rodvian. Aye. Seven in the affirmative, none in the negative. Amendment number one is adopted. Thank you. Madam Secretary, please read amendment number two. Amendment number two, this amendment requires meetings of the Police Accountability Board to provide an opportunity for public comment. This is the second admin amendment. Uh, Mr. Barron, if you'd like to comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. I referenced this in my presentation. As we intended, as the state intended, the Open Meetings Act covers the Police Accountability Board meetings after discussing with a number of members of the public, it became clear that maybe we need to push this a little bit further and require public comment, which the Open Meetings Act technically doesn't require in all cases. So this would require an opportunity for public comment at Police Accountability Board meetings. Motion to adopt, Lacey. Second, Councilman Peruski. Any additional questions? Madam Secretary, please call the roll on amendment number two. Ms. Lacey. Aye. Ms. Pickard. Aye. Mr. Volke. Aye. Mr. Peruski. Aye. Ms. Fiedler. Aye. Ms. Hare. Aye. Ms. Rodvian. Aye. Seven in the affirmative, none in the negative. Amendment number two is adopted. Madam Secretary, please read amendment number three. Amendment number three, this amendment requires the Administrative Charging Committee and any trial boards to be structured as provided in state law. All right, this is another admin amendment. Mr. Barron. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, amendment three is simple. Uh, HB, the, the powers of the Administrative Charging Committee and the Trial Board under HB 670 under the state law are contained in our bill. However, after discussing uh, the bill upon introduction, we realized possibly we should have referred to the state law to make it clear that things like uh, the Administrative Charging Committee's subpoena power, their ability to call witnesses, their procedures that are governed by state law should have been referred to in our code for clarity. We understand uh, that other members of the council have a similar uh, amendment. The way this amendment is structured is done by reference rather than cutting and pasting the state law into ours. All right, very good. Is there a motion to adopt? Motion to adopt, Councilman Peruski. Second, Allison Pickard. Any additional, oh, go ahead, Mr. Pierce. I, I do have a question, Ms. Klossmeyer, and this is where the community testimony and others talk about what's interpreted with state law. My understanding is that state law changes frequently, right? <laughs> so referencing state law as opposed to a particular section, is that the best practice from a legal perspective? Because I know I've seen some other amendments and I just want to be clear, what's the best way? Because again, there's 
my understanding, several bills that are going through the legislature right now that reference state law, and that code could be changed. So I want to get your legal opinion from the county law office of law about what's the best way to reference that. Thank you. Sure. Lori Blair Klassmeyer, Deputy County Attorney. Um, I think you're right. Uh, the, um, as this section changes in the state law, the county would have to go back and change its law if we actually spelled out what's in the state law. So it's the reference to the state law um, is better. We would have to uh, comply with it as it changes over time. Any additional questions for my colleagues? All right, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on amendment number three. Ms. Lacey. Nay. Ms. Pickard. Aye. Mr. Volke. Aye. Mr. Bruski. Aye. Ms. Fiedler. Aye. Ms. Hare. Aye. Ms. Rodvian. Nay. Five in the affirmative, two in the negative. Amendment number three is adopted. Thank you. Madam Secretary, please read amendment number four. Amendment number four. This amendment allows a change of address to a location outside of the county as a cause for removal of a member of the Police Accountability Board. Thank you. This amendment comes from uh, Ms. Pickard and Ms. Fiedler. <laughs> Madam Chair. Go ahead. Thank you. Amanda Feather, District 5. There's language in the bill as far as requirements to be a county resident and a specific year given. We just wanted to make it clear that if someone on the PAB were to move out of the, out of the county, they would then be removed from the PAB. Uh, Mr. Barron. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we intended that you would be a continual resident of Anne Arundel County to be a member of the board. Uh, we thought that was embedded in our bill. Uh, if this makes it more clear, we support. Motion to adopt. Thank you very much. Is Either second. Any additional questions? All right, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on amendment number four. Ms. Lacey. Aye. Ms. Pickard. Aye. Mr. Volke. Aye. Mr. Prusky. Aye. Ms. Fiedler. Aye. Ms. Hare. Aye. Ms. Rodvian. Aye. Seven in the affirmative, none in the negative. Amendment number four is adopted. Um, thank you. Madam Secretary, please read amendment number five. Amendment number five. This amendment defines ride along, corrects a technical error in an indexing of subsections, and requires an annual civilian ride along in an emergency vehicle as a part of the training requirements for voting members of the Police Accountability Board. Uh, this amendment also is from Ms. Pickard and Ms. Fiedler. Whichever of you would like to make a statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Thank you to my co-sponsor. We had the same idea during the work session, so we decided to work together because these are this is one of those things that could um, be you could construct it different ways. So I think the amendment as read speaks for itself. Uh, I think it would be beneficial for PAB members to experience a ride along. Many of us on this council have, and it is very um, uh, impactful. Uh, as you make policy. So I ask my colleagues to support. Motion to adopt. To adopt. Thank you. Yep. Is there a second? Second, Feather. Uh, Mr. Barron, you may respond. Uh, the administration supports the amendment to add to uh, the ethics training, the implicit bias training, the Citizens Police Academy, and the other trainings that may be required. I think this is a good add. Any additional? Oh, Ms. Lacey. Thank you, Madam Chair. It just occurred to me that a question we should ask about ride-alongs. I'm not opposed to requiring ride-alongs, but um, are the ride-alongs, depending on what they are, are they able to accommodate people with disabilities or who might have medical conditions that perhaps could be aggravated by something that happens on a ride-along? I'm going to defer to her chief or anybody in the audience that might. If Mr. Morris. I'm sure we could make accommodations for any individual with an impairment, any type of disability. Okay, um, I might address that in a future amendment, so thanks. All right, thank you. Any additional, Mr. Volke? Thank you, Madam Chair. I guess my question for the sponsors, it's, it's not unfriendly, um, but what's the reason for the inclusion of firefighter, paramedic, or other emergency personnel as opposed to just having it be a police ride along, considering this is the police accountability board? Mr. or Madam Chair. Go ahead. 
I think that we were trying to incorporate just the general definition should ride along be used in future legislation. We have done ride alongs with those entities. Um, it's definition. Madam Chair. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, this particular provision, your, is your thought that this will be embedded somewhere in the code and that this definition may be used in subsequent legislation? Yes. Okay. May I ask one more question? Yeah, go ahead. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry, I was reading the exact language of the amendment. Would, would my colleagues be open, uh, for the public's benefit, we don't get to have these discussions behind closed doors, so would my colleagues be open to an amendment that did not include firefighter, paramedic, or other emergency personnel, but was the same amendment otherwise? Madam Chair? Go ahead. I, I cannot speak for Ms. Pickard. I'd be open to it, but when we talk about ride-alongs, they do include, regardless of this bill or not, they do include other, other departments in the county. Okay. Did you have any other follow-ups? I'm sure I do, but okay. I'm Okay. <laughs> Ms. Hare. Thank you, Madam Chair. Jessica Hare, District 7. The only one thing I would say in response to Councilman Volke's point is that oftentimes the different departments work together, and so when you're on a ride-along with one, you will often then interact with a different department, and so I could definitely see some benefit if in the first year of training uh, a voting member does a ride-along with the police department, but in a subsequent year perhaps does fire or, or something like that, um, you know, having done them. Well, having personally done them with both, it's, I think it's helpful to have perspectives both ways. Ms. Pickard. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just to be clear about what this amendment does and doesn't do, we're adding a definition to the code, the county code, of, to define ride-along, which often happens with fire police. And then in relationship to Bill 1622 in setting up a police accountability board, uh, this, on page six, we're adding a ride-along annually to include, whenever possible, riding along with different county police districts or divisions of other county or state agencies in each. It's meant to be for PAB members, specifically for law enforcement agencies. And the goal would be um, whether you went your first year with Western District of Anne Arundel County and the second year you might uh, do a ride along with the Sheriff's Office as to, to or a different um, district in the county to get a better sense. One is adding a definition to the code. The actual one that pertains to police accountability boards is specifically uh, law enforcement agencies. Thank you. Did I ask you to respond yet? Uh, I, I did. I'm sorry. Recall, we support. Okay. <laughs> no further questions? Uh, Madam oh, go Chair. Ahead, Ms. Lacey. Um, perhaps um, either Ms. Klossmeyer or Ms. Hewitt or Madam Secretary could answer this question. Would this this specifically this definition if we did adopt this amendment and we have this definition i mean i think it doesn't really belong in the pab bill if it's going to be broader than what the pab is about so would it get codified by the codifier to some other more appropriate section of the code it would only apply in this section of the code it wouldn't apply throughout the code because it's only in this bill in order to have it apply throughout the code you would need to do something like put the definitions up in Title I, which are the definitions. So, thank you. And I actually would like a uh, like to ask a question as well. Would um, would this definition, police officer, firefighter, paramedic, or other emergency personnel, would that include the sheriff? Are they considered emergency personnel? Technically, yes, they're law enforcement entity. All right. Very good. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Volke. Thanks, Madam Chair. Just for the benefit of my colleagues, I just went back and asked that an amendment be drafted to take out this other language. So that'll be Amendment 49 when we get there. Um, so depending on how this goes, I'm, pr I'm just going to tee this up. I'm probably voting against this because I'm going to have another amendment that I think will fix this issue. All right, seeing no additional questions, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on amendment number five. Ms. Lacey. Nay. Ms. Pickard. Aye. Mr. Volke. Nay. Mr. Pruski. Aye. Ms. Fiedler. Aye. Ms. Hare. Aye. Ms. Rodvian. Aye. Five in the affirmative, two in the negative. Amendment number five is adopted. Madam Secretary, please read amendment number six. Amendment number six. This amendment requires that all voting members of the Police Accountability Board be residents of the county. 
Um, Mr. Volke and Ms. Fiedler, this is your amendment. Go ahead, Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so again, as Mr. Barron was indicating, I think it was the administration's intent that everyone be a current resident of the county who is on the board. This just simply clarifies that again to make sure that that's abundantly clear that you have to be a current resident. We've dealt with it partly with the amendment that Ms. Fiedler and Ms. Pickard put up um, that says that's a basis for removal. This would just clarify further that in order to be a member, you must be a county resident. So with that, I'd uh, move the amendment. Is there a second? Um, Mr. Barron, would you like to respond? Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. As noted in the previous amendment, that was our intent. We think the bill stands and includes this requirement, but clarity doesn't hurt. All right, so thank we support. Thank you. Seeing no additional red lights from my colleagues, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on amendment number six. Ms. Lacey. Aye. Ms. Pickard. Aye. Mr. Volke. Aye. Mr. Pruski. Aye. Ms. Fiedler. Aye. Ms. Hare. Aye. Ms. Rodvian. Aye. Seven in the affirmative, none in the negative. Amendment number six is adopted. All right. Um, Madam Secretary, please read amendment number seven. Amendment number seven, this amendment requires that all voting members of the Police Accountability Board be appointed by the County Executive and confirmed by the County Council. Um, this again is an uh, amendment from Mr. Volke and Ms. Fiedler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this amendment would ensure that all members of the board are appointed by the county council. Currently, the way that the legislation is drafted, there is a member who comes from Annapolis who is selected by the mayor and confirmed by the city council. This would ensure that the county council also votes on that person. Move the amendment. Is there a second? Fiedler, second. Thank you. Mr. Barron, would you like to respond? Yeah, I had to, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I had to read this amendment several times to understand what was going on. It was our intent that the mayor and city council would be able to pick their member and send them to the county for appointment because the local governing body has to do the actual appointment. It, it, can I just clarify with the sponsor, the city would still be able to pick their appointment, correct? Yeah, my understanding is the city will still do their process, but then it will come to the county who will then have to subsequently confirm that person as well. I have a representative from the city, so I'm gonna to turn to Ms. McCoy. Uh, respectfully, sir, I would think that um, that would make the city's vote moot if you have to confirm it. If you don't agree and you don't pick the person, why would we then go through the tedious process of taking it through the, uh, the mayor and then through the city council and then through you? Um, we ask for this because uh, we, uh, the way that the state structured the bill was that uh, Annapolis uh, Police Department is represented along with the county and we're, we know that you're used to dealing with just county entities, but now you have the city entity, and we believe that the city needs that voice. It needs its own separate voice, and it should have that there. Madam Secretary, um, please call the roll on amendment number seven. Oh, I'm sorry, if there's additional questions, we can go ahead, Ms. Pickard. I'm sorry. So, if this if this passes and is inserted into the bill, does that make, does that bring the bill into compliance with the state law or? My, and I'll turn to Office of Law if there's any, if I get it wrong, my understanding of the, the way we drafted it, we would comply with state law because the, the, um, city is bringing the name and we're appointing them officially. I think the, the concern that Ms. McCoy ex expressed with this amendment, I think we share a little bit. The intent of the bill is not to allow a county pick, oh, to pick over the mayor and city council. The, the city should have a seat on this board even if we have to do a formal appointment. Madam Chair. Go ahead. Thank you. Can, does this take us out of compliance with state law if we pass this? 
Lori Blair Klassen, our Deputy County Attorney. The only thing that the state law requires with respect to membership is that the, uh, the county establish the membership. So no, there's nothing in here that's that specific. Okay. Nothing in the state law that's that specific. Thank you. I'd like, oh, go ahead, Ms. Pickard. So I'm confused. So if we, the, the goal would be to have the city, the mayor, and the council send the recommendation, and that, in my mind, would be a safe appointment from the council, right? But if we change this language, I'm just concerned that, as Mr. Barron said, uh, and, and our city represented uh, mentioned that the council could usurp that if we add this language. Is that anybody else's concern? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to chime in here because I actually think this is a little bit, uh, this extends beyond just the city representation. Um, I, I don't know if we're envisioning a separate resolution for each member or, well, I guess eventually we would because they're not, they're on, um, you know, sort of staggered. But the initial appointment, um, I don't know if we're envisioning a separate resolution for each member of the PAB or are we talking about a separate uh, or, or one for all, for the whole group. And if it's one for the whole group, I can imagine that, you know, we would just, we would take all those folks and pass them as a, a single slate, sort of more as a ceremonial um, fact rather than, in, you know, addressing each individual. But um, I, I guess this is maybe a question for Office of Law. Anyone who feels like they understand what the, what the state law was requiring here. Were they requesting individual appointments or is this really a slate? Um, county executive and then confirmed by the county council by resolution, confirmed individually, we don't really know. Right, um, Lori Blair, class on our deputy county attorney. So, so this is all left up to the county to legislate how this appointment process occurs. So, and I, my guess is whether you would get an entire slate or you would get them in groups or individuals is going to depend on how quickly the the, the appointees can be identified through the through the application process. If I may, Madam go ahead, Chair. Mr. Barron. So, it, once this board is up and running, it's an existing board. There will be times when a member falls off for whatever reason, and there will be singular appointments. Happy to work with the council if the council objects with the approach, but because we need to bring and create an entire new board, our intention would be to bring all the appointments at once um, in the beginning. And then obviously it'll stagger and change, but I think that's a discussion for a different resolution. Um, as we appoint folks, it's much more important from the county executive's perspective that we find good folks, not necessarily the mechanics of whether it's one resolution or nine. I'm happy to do nine if that's what the council desires. My concern is that we, you know, we will, there will be future county executives that will not be the current county executive. And I want to make sure that, you know, if the city is, is going to have its an appointment, I represent the city, so I want to make sure the city is in good hands, um, that if they make their appointment, that we can ensure that that actually makes it all the way through the process. And so I'm not convinced that we have any way to ensure, based on what the state law is, do we have any way to ensure that the city's um, representative makes it through the process? It, you know, without opposition, if that's who the city chose. And I guess that's a question for Office of Law, Ms. Klassmeyer. Sure. Um, there's nothing in the state law. This is all, this is what they are, we are required to make this from whole cloth, essentially, and this is what the proposal is. So basically, for the city, res the city uh, representative would be a resident of the city for at least three years and appointed by the county executive upon recommendation of the mayor and city council. And Madam Chair, go ahead, uh, Ms. Lacey. Just to add to what Ms. Klausmeyer just read, it says in the current draft, it says that that person shall be appointed by the county executive upon recommendation of the mayor and city council. So it's actually set up where the county executive has no discretion and must appoint that person that the mayor and city council have approved. So I think the current version of the bill is more protective of the, the appointee from the city of Annapolis than amendment number seven would be. 
Madam Chair, that okay. uh, Councilwoman Lacey is is stating our intent correctly. That was the intent of us drafting the bill was to make sure that the city had its own appointment. Go ahead, Mr. Prusky. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I think it's pretty clear that we have a representative from the Annapolis City government and they have said they oppose this amendment. So I think we should listen to their will. They're a part of Anne Arundel and that's part of the bill. I respect and understand where we want to go, but I think we just heard what the opinion is and I think we should honor it. Thank you. Seeing no additional lights, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on amendment number seven. Miss Lacey. Nay. Ms. Pickard? Nay. Mr. Volke? Aye. Mr. Prusky? Nay. Ms. Fiedler? Aye. Ms. Hare? Aye. Ms. Rodvian? Nay. Three in the affirmative, four in the negative. Amendment number seven has failed. Thank you. Um, Madam Secretary, please read amendment number eight. Amendment number eight. This amendment does not limit the reason this, I'm sorry, let me start over, please. This amendment does not limit the reasons a person can be removed from the board and removes immoral conduct as an example of cause for removal of a member of the Police Accountability Board. Um, this actually had four sponsors, um, Mr. Volke, Ms. Lacey, myself, and Ms. Fiedler. Um, Mr. Volke, your name's first on the list, so if you'd like to make a comment, and then I see. Oh, no, Ms. Pickard is, nope, go ahead. No, she's Sorry. just ready to vote. Yeah, she, <laughs> oh. uh, when it has four you, sponsors, Madam your odds are good. Yeah. Yeah, I'm hoping to have better success with this one. Um, this is a pretty ambiguous term, and um, I asked Ms. Hewitt to do some legal research on this. She did, and we had a hard time finding any instances in state law where immoral conduct is defined. For that reason, because of the lack of a clear definition, that was my reason for seeking to remove this from the bill. I think there are other mechanisms that exist that the county executive can remove individuals from the board if the circumstances warrant. So for that reason, I would move the amendment. Is there a second? Lacey, second. Thank you. Um, Mr. Barron. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, knowing that there are four co-sponsors, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll keep it brief. I think the, the intent of this language was to ensure that there is a mechanism to remove a, a board member if their conduct is unbecoming of a member of the Police Accountability Board, and that could stretch into um, private conduct that maybe is not raising to the level of a crime or another reason. Um, the uh, administration will be supporting future amendments uh, that are coming down that would give the county council the ability to override a removal. We think that's a good check on on our power. Uh, our, our preference is to leave this language in, but I, I know when we're beat. I'm, I'm just concerned about the very, very subjective nature of a phrase like immoral conduct, for example. I, th I know a superintendent in Texas was dismissed after he posted photographs of himself and his wife who were in an interracial marriage. Um, and so immoral conduct um, can be interpreted in ways that might be quite offensive. And, and for the record, I will state, <laughs> we, we know the term was maybe inartful, but we were trying to get to a, a good place there, I swear. Understood. All right, seeing no additional lights, um, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on amendment number eight. Ms. Lacey. Aye. Ms. Pickard. Aye. Mr. Volke. Aye. Mr. Prusky. Aye. Ms. Fiedler. Aye. Ms. Hare. Aye. Ms. Rodvian. Aye. Seven in the affirmative, none in the negative. Amendment number eight is adopted. Madam Secretary, please read amendment number nine. Amendment number nine. This amendment adds a definition of hearing board and amends portions of bill number 1622 to refer to hearing boards instead of trial boards. Um, Mr. Volke and Ms. Fiedler, this is your amendment. You may have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this stems from really a perception issue. Um, the bill refers to trial boards. That is something that the state law uses. I believe it might be more appropriate in this instance to refer to this as a hearing board because that is in fact what the officers are having, a hearing in front of a board to decide whether misconduct occurred or not. Um, so with that, this first defines that a hearing board means the same thing as a trial board and then uses the term hearing board throughout the legislation. I just think that from a perception standpoint, it's more fair to the police officers 
who are in front of this board to have that be the terminology used. So with that, I'd move the amendment. Is there a second? Feed their second. Um, Mr. Barron, you may respond. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, understand where the sponsor is coming from here. Uh, the administration opposes this bill not because uh, we never necessarily are in love with, with the terminology in the state bill. It will create confusion if in the county we are using a different term. Um, although I recognize that the administration recognizes the um, sort of semantic nature of this amendment. However, uh, the reason uh, we, think it's, we think it's important to match the state law as to this, you'll be seeing regulations coming down from the Maryland Police Training and Standards Commission referring to trial boards. Um, that is the verbiage the state used. Ms. Pickard. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I don't want to put our chief on the spot, but um, how are trial boards referred to currently? Because I think they're trial boards. Uh, currently, they're referred to as administrative hearing boards. The perception that Mr. Volke speaks to, quite frankly, um, is that an officer is on trial for a criminal offense, and that's not the case. It's an administrative procedure. And my thoughts are it should be referenced as an administrative hearing board. May I follow up? Go ahead. So, but it is my understanding that there's trial board in other language. Is it in the code? I mean, or where, where, where did this come from to begin with? Uh, recent legislation, it's always been referred to as administrative hearing board. Gotcha. Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. Lacey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I think we, we all missed our opportunity to heavily lobby the General Assembly to give it some other name that's better, right? So it's trial board, and I think to avoid confusion, keeping a trial board is probably best. But I do wonder whether if we were to call it an administrative trial board, whether that might be enough of a difference, because I do agree very much with the concern that the perception, and even a lot of the later amendments that we have are also about that, of the perception of what this board is and what it's doing. I'm just afraid if we get rid of the word trial, then introducing confusion is almost worse than, uh, than the other way around. I see our, our attorney, um, council attorney, has um, her light on. Ms. Shewitt. Oh, I didn't mean to. I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> I was hoping you were going to resolve this with a brilliant comment. Um, Ms. Fiedler. Thank you, Madam Chair. As co-sponsor on this amendment, I just want to clarify. So an officer accused of misconduct is different than an officer who commits a criminal act. And that, I think, is where we're trying to be very clear that the two are very different and go through a very different process. So attaching a term that is associated with an act over here when it's an act over here, I think, creates more detrimental confusion than having different language than the state. So. Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I think the one thing that I would just remind the council is similar to the comments that my colleague from District 4 made about the city of Annapolis and having someone who is an expert from the city of Annapolis, and so we should defer to their opinion and vote in a particular way. We have the police chief here. She's given her opinion on this. She is the expert. So I think in this case, we should similarly, as we did on the last one, defer to her and her ideas um, if we're going to be consistent in terms of our rationale. I certainly appreciate that rationale, but at the same time, we're their elected body here to, to make these calls, so I think we have to use our own best judgment. I have a concern that there may be parallel um, proceedings, and, and this is really maybe getting more into the weeds than we need to, but you could have an administrative hearing and a criminal trial at the same time for the same conduct. Um, probably, I would assume, that crim like a criminal proceeding could happen later. I mean, if the, if the um, officer's conduct amounted to something that could also be criminal, you could have both. Is that correct? That is correct, ma'am. That would be a trial. So we do have a trial versus a trial board. Ms. Fiedler. Uh, Ms. Fiedler. I just want to make a correction. Hearing. I'm sorry. Yes, but currently. Yeah, thank you. Currently. If we fix it, it will be more clear. All right. Seeing no additional lights, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on amendment number... Nine. Miss Lacey. 
With no disrespect to the chief, <laughs> nay. <laughs> Ms. Pickard. Aye. Mr. Volke. Aye. Mr. Prusky. Aye. Ms. Fiedler. Aye. Ms. Hare. Aye. Ms. Rodvian. Aye. Six in the affirmative, one in the negative. Amendment number nine is adopted. Madam Secretary, please read amendment number 10. Amendment number 10, this amendment changes the years of residency in the county for voting members of the board from three years to two years. Um, Ms. Lacey, this amendment is yours and mine. Um, if you would like to make a statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just think three, you don't need three years to understand the uh, kind of conduct that happens with, with people and their interactions in the police. I mean, I'm assuming you're an adult and you know you live, live in the county, then two years is plenty of time. And so I move the amendment. I'll second. Uh, Mr. Barron. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is a perfect example of sort of you have to make a choice as uh, when you're drafting legislation. And is three the right number? Is two the right number? I don't know. We had to make a choice. We picked three. We have no objection if the council decides to lower it to two. Any additional discussion? Seeing none, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on amendment number 10. My apologies, did I miss the motion and second? No. We, we did, did it. I was the it. second. I'm so sorry. Um, we were stealth. Okay. My apologies. Miss Lacey. Hi. Miss Pickard. Nay. Mr. Volke. Nay. Mr. Prusky. Aye. Miss Fiedler. Nay. Miss Hare. Nay. Miss Rodvian. Aye. So that's three in the affirmative, four in the negative. Amendment number 10 has failed. Thank you. Um, Madam Secretary, please read amendment number 11. Amendment number 11, this amendment changes terminology to require a voting member of the board to have resided in the city of Annapolis for a certain period of time. Um, again, this is uh, Ms. Lacey and my amendment. Ms. Lacey. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is just uh, purely a, a drafting thing. It doesn't change any meaning. You could almost call it technical. It's just making the language be parallel in two different provisions. Move to amend. I mean, motion to adopt, excuse me. <laughs> Second. I'm Mr. Barron. We support the, the amendment. Thank you. Seeing no lights, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on number, uh, res, uh, amendment number 11. Ms. Lacey. Aye. Ms. Pickard. Aye. Mr. Volke. Aye. Mr. Prusky. Aye. Ms. Fiedler. Aye. Ms. Hare. Aye. Ms. Radvian. Aye. Seven in the affirmative, none in the negative. Amendment number 11 is adopted. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Please read amendment number 12. Amendment number 12, this amendment allows council members to recommend appointments from each of their districts to the county executive for a potential appointment. Thank you again, this is Ms. Lacey and I's amendment, Ms. Lacey. Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, one of the things that um, various advocates have been asking for would be to have the uh, members of the PA be appointed by each um, each one of us separately as you know, someone from our districts. Um, I, th I think that might inadvertently work to the bad. It might make it actually too narrow in that um, I don't, I think what we were looking for actually is where there might be, uh, among other factors, a geographic concentration of um, higher frequencies of interaction with law enforcement officers. And so it, we should, I took their suggestion and I think it might work better if instead we each have the opportunity to uh, nominate someone for consideration by the county executive. And since overall the county executive, he or she is going to have to be trying to come up with a, an appropriate balance to meet all the different things that we're looking for, um, then I think that flexibility would be helpful. So with that, I move to adopt. Rod being second. And Mr. Barron. So this amendment, um, well, first we support, um, to be clear, uh, this county executive has always consulted with council members as it comes to appointment, understand we're legislating for the future as well. Um, and uh, just to, to be clear, this requirement will allow a council member to suggest a name to the county executive. Um, I assure this council with or without this amendment, 
you can always send us a name. But we support the amendment. Any additional discussion? Seeing none, Ms. Uh, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on amendment number 12. Ms. Lacey. Aye. Ms. Pickard. Aye. Mr. Volke. Aye. Mr. Prusky. Aye. Ms. Fiedler. Aye. Ms. Hare. Aye. Ms. Rodvian. Aye. Seven in the affirmative, none in the negative. Amendment number 12 is adopted. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Please read amendment number 13. Amendment number 13, this amendment requires the composition of the Police Accountability Board to reflect gender identity amongst the voting membership. Um, again, this is um, Ms. Lacey and I's amendment. Ms. Lacey, if you would. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, this one and the next couple um, have to do with that one, that provision of uh, membership and the state law says uh, that we have to look at the, uh, I guess, racial and gender diversity and another thing that I'm forgetting. It does not say gender identity. That's something that um, advocates have suggested. I don't know if, uh, if I could tell you specifically who suggested it to me, but, um, but I think it doesn't hurt to, to include this as a characteristic that can be uh, relevant to consider for membership. With that, I move to adopt. Uh, Rod to be in second. And Mr. Barron, you have the floor. Um, the intent of the bill is to make sure that the Police Accountability Board broadly res reflects all communities, and that means, uh, uh, which one are we on, uh, gender identity folks uh, who, who may not have, um, or who may have a different gender identity. So. We, we have no opposition to this amendment um, being included as it was always the intent to give everyone an equal opportunity to participate on the board. Seeing no questions from my colleagues, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on amendment number 13. Ms. Lacey. Aye. Ms. Pickard. Aye. Mr. Volke. Nay. Mr. Prusky. Aye. Ms. Fiedler. Nay. Ms. Hare. Nay. Ms. Rodvian. Aye. Four in the affirmative, three in the negative. Amendment number 13 is adopted. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Please read amendment number 14. Amendment number 14. This amendment requires the composition of the Police Accountability Board to reflect sexual orientation amongst the voting membership. Um, again, this is uh, Ms. Lacey and I's amendment. Ms. Lacey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Basically the same explanation as the previous one, except a, a different way, because I thought we might not all want to vote on the same things together. So that's why it's separate, and I move to adopt. Rod being second. Uh, Mr. Barron. Again, the, the intent of the state law and the intention of our bill is to be inclusive. We think the bill captures this, but we have no objection to calling it out. Seeing no questions from my colleagues, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on amendment number 14. Ms. Lacey. Aye. Ms. Pickard. Aye. Mr. Volke. Nay. Mr. Prusky. Aye. Ms. Fiedler. Nay. Ms. Hare. Nay. Ms. Rodvian. Aye. Four in the affirmative, three in the negative. Amendment number 14 has been adopted. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Please read amendment number 15. Amendment number 15. This amendment requires that the board have represent representation from communities that have historically experienced or currently experience higher frequencies of interaction with law enforcement. Again, this uh, is Ms. Lacey and my amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so the bill currently refers to communities um, and doesn't expand on what those communities uh, may include, which I originally, when I read the bill, I thought it implied that it was limited to a geographic area and then thought, well, maybe it's li limited to a, a racial composition overlaid with a geographic area, but no, it's even broader than that. And so um, this is, is meant to make clear that um, the, the populations, identities, geographic areas, and communities that historically experienced or currently experience higher frequencies of interaction with law enforcement are the ones we're looking at. Move to adopt. Rod being second. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Barron. You'd think by now I'd have this down. <laughs> it's all right, Madam Chair. Uh, so a as the sponsor noted, the intent that the... Um, Okay, sorry. Um, the, the intent of 
the that section when we drafted it was to be inclusive and to include communities that may experience um, higher frequencies of interactions with law enforcement, no matter whether they're geographic or um, some sort of characteristic, whether it's mental illness or racial or, or members of the LGBTQ community, whatever it, it had been, that was the intent when we drafted the bill. Um, this language um, makes it a little more prescriptive, and if the council wants to, to put this into code, um, we, we would support it. I think the, the intent of uh, the way we drafted the bill was to capture um, and ensure that the police accountability board is meant to include and have representation from all communities, and that's uh, how we read the bill. Ms. Hare. Um, I don't, I'm all set. Thanks. Oh, Ms. Fiedler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Amanda Fiedler, District 5. So um, I'm going to make a comment on, on this amendment. Um, before we vote, and it applies to the previous amendments, I'm comfortable with the language that's currently in the bill. So thank you. All right, um, seeing no, first, no further lights, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on amendment number 15. Ms. Lacey. Aye. Ms. Pickard. Aye. Mr. Volke. Nay. Mr. Prusky. Aye. Ms. Fiedler. Nay. Ms. Hare. Nay. Ms. Rodvian. Aye. Four in the affirmative, three in the negative. Amendment number 15 is adopted. Thank you. Madam Secretary, please read amendment number 16. Amendment number 16. This amendment removes the list of specific professional or lived experiences that should be considered when voting members of the Police Accountability Board are selected. Um, thank you. Again, this is Ms. Lacey and my amendment. Uh, Ms. Lacey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so um, one of the things that our community advocates have consistently brought up is that they feel that the long list of, uh, of potential experience and expertise, community organization, civil rights, law enforcement, criminal law, behavioral health, faith-based leadership, community policing, policing standards, sociology, education, social work, criminology, um, personnel management, discipline, juvenile services, which I admit was my suggestion, or other life experience that may be valuable to the board. They feel that this list frames the, um, the life and professional experience and expertise too narrowly and implies that uh, the, the people who are going to be best to serve on this board are people who have letters after their names, they have credentials, or um, and that it overall implies that that's what's required, as opposed to um, you can have an application form that says, you know, please let us know why you think you, your life experience would, your professional experience, whatever it is, would be helpful to the board. And so um, I'm bringing this amendment to give voice to that suggestion. Motion to adopt. Radvian second. Oh, oh Mr. Barron. Um, Just jump in. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so uh, appreciate that concern that the intent is not to to make this uh, board an alphabet soup of credentials. I think we tried to strike a balance that would include folks from all walks of life. The, the administration opposes this amendment because we believe that we need to have some guidance on what we're looking for. This is not a exclusive list. This you don't. There could be people who fit with expertise um, outside of this list. But this was brought forward in discussion um, with with everybody and watching the the decisions being made at the state level of how they envisioned um, the police accountability board to function in that it's supposed to provide guidance and policy advice and review trends and wanting to have a diversity of skills 
skills that come to the table and make a good board that can look at it. The idea here was here are the type of skills that we think should be represented, but it is not we don't have to check the box and say, well, we've got our sociologist or we've got, we can have a board without somebody with a sociology uh, or even a law enforcement background or a civil rights background. The idea here was a list of skills that might be valuable to the board, which is, I guess, maybe um, why we, we have that last um, catch-all so that in the application form, and you can go to it on the interest application, there is actually a question, what skills, I can't remember exactly how it's phrased, but what skills do you have that would be why you would want to serve on this board? Madam Chair. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, that's great. I didn't know about the form until tonight, so if you'd let me know, I could have maybe tailored my argument differently. Differently, but um, I, to me, the main the main point is that this is a nine member board of ordinary people, and this board is going to have the ability to call in experts if they have any area that they feel that they are not expert in, and they want to get other opinions or information or advice, then they will have the resources to be able to do that. But otherwise, what we're talking about is accountability to an ordinary person. And so I, that's why that's, I'm happy to bring the amendment. I realize that's not the administration's position, but there it lies. Any additional questions from my colleagues? All right, seeing none, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on uh, amendment number 16. Ms. Lacey. Aye. Ms. Pickard. Nay. Mr. Volke. Nay. Mr. Prusky. Aye. Ms. Fiedler. Nay. Ms. Hare. Nay. Ms. Rodvian. Aye. Three in the affirmative, four in the negative. Amendment number 16 has failed. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Please read amendment number 17. Amendment number 17, this amendment expands the type of life experiences that should be considered when voting members of the Police <coughs> Accountability Board are selected. Um, again, this is Ms. Lacey and I's amendment. Ms. Lacey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Anticipating the prior result, I am offering an alternative amendment that just amends the last paragraph um, of the long list, which currently reads, other life experience that may be valuable to the board. Um, and I propose replacing that with other relevant professional or lived experience, including but not limited to mental health disorders, substance abuse disorders, trauma, immigration, or the working poor. And I would recognize that um, a, a few of these phrases, mental health disorders and substance abuse disorders, can fall under the umbrella of behavioral health um, in up further in that same paragraph. Um, but I don't think it hurts to list them here. So I move to adopt. Rod being second, and Mr. Barron. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so again, the administration prefers the, the way we drafted it. We think we captured these um, uh, these ideas that that said this isn't a, a bad amendment understand the sponsor's intent in trying to make sure that we're putting a, a statement into the code that this board has to look out for um, uh, folks who have particular challenges whether um, they fit into one of those including but not limited that the the amendment references or others. Um, so we don't have um, strong opposition, just a preference for the way we did it. Really quick, Madam Go Chair. Ahead. Just uh, to point out, um, the person having professional experience or lived experience, you know, your lived experience can come from your experience of another person's Undergoing a disorder or a trauma or, or whatever. I don't. I don't mean to just limit this to just your personal. That's why it doesn't say personal experience, but your your overall uh, relationship with others. So just to clarify. Thank you. And I believe Mr. Prusky, you were next. I'm good. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> Ms. Pickard. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, while I understand the, I think I understand the intent of the sponsor, 
I have maybe a different concern with this language and how it would be potentially reflected on uh, an applicant's, uh, uh, an interested party's application. It, uh, it's not, I, I'm finding it, I'm not, it's not sitting well with me. I'd rather keep those uh, life experienced, lived or otherwise in that catch-all other life experience that may be valuable to the board. I, I'd hate for someone to be the, the mental health disorder PAB member or the, I, 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 I I'm not, or the working poor member of the PAB member. I'm not finding that to be, I don't like the language. I like the way it's written here. So I'm gonna oppose this amendment. I certainly appreciate that, but I also think many people realize that their unique life experience um, struggling with mental health disorders or having a family member who struggles with mental health disorders and having, um, you know, ha observing how that person has interacted, um, you know, can be very valuable in conversations. We, we know. Um, we, we know that some of these groups um, that we're discussing here are, are among those who have greater interaction with uh, police, and so I think they're, they're uh, very valuable to the conversation. We think about the PAB. The role of the PAB is to improve, um, Im improve policing, and if you have people sitting at the table who can talk about their experience, who may have had interactions with police, I think that's a very valuable trait to bring to the table. So that's, that's why I'm supporting this amendment and I have my name on it. Ms. Fiedler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Amanda Fiedler, District 5. Mr. Barron, I just want to thank you for your thoughtful comments. Um, I'm comfortable with the language in the bill right now. Thank you. Mr. Volke. Thank you. Uh, just confirming, Mr. Barron, there's nothing in the bill as drafted that would preclude the administration from taking special consideration of a certain applicant who does have a sensitivity to mental health issues or to the experience of an immigrant or to trauma or substance abuse, is there? No, and, and uh, in fact, it's the intent of this administration to actively recruit and seek out folks with a diversity of life and lived experience. And um, as we supported the previous amendment that allows a council member to suggest someone, please help bring folks forward who can add their important perspective to this uh, board. And I will um, take a moment to echo, I, I agree with Madam Chair's uh, comments that folks do have important life experience that they can bring to the board. Um, and it's our intent to make sure we do um, have a good, strong board with lots of um, different life experience and perspective. We think the language as we drafted it gives the kind of flexibility to make sure that happens. Thank you. I'm just going to jump in. With all due respect, this is, um, you know, this is never any any of these amendments that we're making are, are not necessarily about the current county executive. This is going to be an ongoing board that you know may that will eventually will have a different county executive, um, regardless of the election results in 2022. Um, there are term limits in this county, so we have to really plan for the future. And, um, and, I, I, and I believe, oh. I was just going to say, if I, if I may, Madam Chair, I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, I, I, I agree and think we do need to be looking towards the future because it's a partnership between the executive and legislative branch as the bill is drafted. The county executive may bring names forward, but the county council will need to approve them. Ms. Pickard. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, 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 I 100% agree with the value of the lived experience or um, in this amendment. I'm just getting concerned that there are going to be, at least tonight, by the way the bill is written, there are nine voting members of the PAB, and not all of these descriptors or characteristics are, are probably going to be represented individually. So I, I, I prefer the language. Um, of the last, um, which is it's, which is the catch-all, because we could probably add amendment after amendment after amendment with the different characteristics or experiences that would be valuable on the board, and it sort of could be endless. So I'm, I'm but I appreciate. I do want, I do value these um, 
uh, characteristics as <clears throat> having value to the PAB. Ms. Lacey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so the characteristics in this amendment are, again, mental health disorders, substance abuse disorders, trauma, immigration, or the working poor. And it's including but not limited to. And these are relevant professional lived experiences. And I think my colleagues who find an inconsistency between you know, keeping a long list of um, fields that sound clinical compared to lived experience that calls out what the ordinary person will definitely understand as a space where they can come participate in a county board that they might not have ever thought they had the experience or the credentials to participate in. Um, how can we judge them and shut down that, that person? I think this amendment just adds to the inclusivity and if you supported keeping the long list because you like the enumeration, you should support this amendment. Ms. Oh, Ms. Fiedler, you have your life light out at this time. All right, um, seeing no additional lights, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on amendment number 17. Ms. Lacey. Aye. Ms. Pickard. Nay. Mr. Volke. Nay. Mr. Prusky. Aye. Ms. Fiedler. Nay. Ms. Hare. Nay. Ms. Rodvian. Aye. Three in the affirmative, four in the negative. Amendment number 17 has been defeated. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Please read amendment number 18. Amendment number 18, this amendment removes the requirement that a voting member of the Police Accountability Board be subject to a preliminary criminal background investigation, removes the prohibition on the appointment of anyone convicted of certain crimes, and removes super superfluous language. Thank you again. This is an amendment from Ms. Lacey and myself. Um, Ms. Lacey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, you know, if you want to take a turn, you can. But um, <laughs> you're doing great. <laughs> uh, okay, so this and the next couple of amendments are a couple of alternative amendments. Um, since I don't know where the council might land, uh, one of the uh, comments and uh, requests from various advocates has been to not require a criminal background investigation, um, and to, or if you had it, I mean, maybe that needs to come later on in the process, but not just to apply. They feel very strongly that both that and um, the following two paragraphs, or the following paragraph, excuse me, about the uh, felonies and uh, crimes of, uh, you know, falsehoods, different iterations of those, um, that stating them here in the bill as opposed to allowing people to apply and then finding out later, okay, so this person's not a good candidate because of X, Y, or Z. Um, I agree with them. They should be able to apply. Anyone should be able to apply based on the minimum requirements. And you never know. I do feel strongly um, that there's this thing called redemption and that people do have the ability to change and improve themselves. They can make mistakes, learn from them, and become better people. And uh, I don't think we need to jump to the worst possible conclusion about a potential applicant. And so I move to amend. Rod being second. Mr. Barron. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the administration opposes this amendment um, as we walk through a couple of the coming alternatives. Um, our, our opposition will get a little bit softer, um, but on this one, uh, we feel quite strongly that um, this Re requirement is necessary. I will flag for the council that as as you're all aware by now, the, the Police Accountability Board makes appointments to the Administrative Charging Committee and the Trial Board, including a member who sits on the Administrative Charging, or sits on the Accountability Board, will sit for sure on the administrative charging committee, whether it's the chair or the chair's designee who they appoint from that, from their group. Um, we anticipate that the Maryland Police Training and Standards Commission will promulgate regulations in the near term that, that are stricter than even the administration drafted our bill as it relates to a person's criminal background. So, um, <coughs> 
were comfortable with the bill as drafted and would ask the council to reject this amendment. Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, question for Office of Law. We still disqualify people from voting in this state who are convicted of a felony, right? Um, I do believe so. Okay. And with respect to theft, dishonesty, fraud, other crimes of moral turpitude, again, you all are lawyers. These are generally disqualifiers for many things under the law um, in terms of people's ability to serve. And in fact, if I'm not mistaken, if you have a crime that deals with honesty effectively, um, that can be a bar in terms of your ability to testify in certain proceedings or at least to be openly impeached pretty heavily for it, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, definitely the first part of your statement. They are, it, it does disqualify. I have seen it as disqualifying language right. before. Okay. All right. So we're not exactly going out on a limb here by saying that individuals who have been convicted of a felony or who have been proven to not be honest individuals should be disqualified from serving on this board. I would agree that this would not be uncommon. Thank you. Any additional comments or questions? I just, um, I know this may not be the authoritative site or the authoritative source, but um, I'm looking at the People's Law Library of Maryland and it, it says here, you can vote even if you were convicted of a felony if the felony convictions are not for the crime of buying or selling votes and you have completed your imprisonment. Um, you can vote while on probation unless you were convicted of buying or selling votes. So it's pretty narrow, the, <laughs> assuming that this is correct. I, I would hope this, you know, obviously I just pulled this up, but um, you, you do get a lot of rights restored after you've served your time, and I, I'm also a believer in redemption. I know that, um, you know, just in, in my district, some of the, the best mentors that we have for young people are people that have been down the path of criminal activity and then turned their lives around and chosen to serve young people. Um, so anyway, with that, I will obviously be supporting my own amendment, but I see no additional lights. Madam Secretary, please call the roll on men amendment number 18. Ms. Lacey. Aye. Ms. Pickard. Nay. Mr. Volke. Nay. Mr. Pruski. Nay. Ms. Fiedler. Nay. Ms. Hare. Nay. Ms. Radvian. Aye. Two in the affirmative, five in the negative. Amendment number 18 has been defeated. Madam Secretary, please read amendment number 19. Amendment number 19, this amendment removes a prohibition on the appointment of anyone convicted of certain crimes and removes super superfluous language. Um, again, this is Ms. Lacey and I's amendment. Ms. Lacey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, second iteration uh, at this is to uh, keep the background check requirement but delete the absolute prohibition on appointment of anyone convicted of certain crimes. I move to amend. I mean, adopt. Jeez. <laughs> Rod being second. And Mr. Barron, go ahead. Uh, administration opposes... Um, the uh, responsibility, well, I'll just say this, the same arguments apply. The, the administrative charging committee and the responsibilities of this board, we think uh, should, uh, we think there should be a standard of a background check and uh, a bar for certain types of criminal activities. Sorry, I mixed up my words. Any additional comments or questions from my colleagues? Seeing none, Madam Secretary, uh, please call the roll on amendment number 19. Ms. Lacey. Aye. Ms. Pickard. Nay. Mr. Volke. Nay. Mr. Pruski. Nay. Ms. Fiedler. Nay. Ms. Hare. Nay. Ms. Radvian. Aye. Two in the affirmative, five in the negative. Amendment number 19 has been defeated. Madam Secretary, please read amendment number 20. Amendment number 20. This amendment limits the time period a person convicted of a crime of violence or felony has to wait before being eligible to serve as a member of the board to 30 years and limits the time period a person convicted of a non-felony crime has to wait before being eligible to serve as a member of the board to 10 years. Um, thank you. Again, this is Ms. Lacey and I's amendment. Ms. Lacey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, so uh, third attempt, and I realize it may be three strikes, but um, I am, uh, I've really tried to come down to the point of view of having zero opportunity 
for someone with the convictions in the, that middle paragraph to ever, no matter what, no matter if they've paid their entire debt to society, they've done all their jail time and their probation, and now they, you know, mow grandmother's backyards and they do all kinds of great stuff for puppies and kittens. And no, we still can't have them even apply and be considered for our PAB. It bothers my conscience. I'd ask for your support for this amendment. I move to adopt. Rodby and second. Mr. Barron. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so uh, as I uh, hinted at earlier, our, our opposition will get a little softer on this one. We still oppose, but um, for, for the record, um, the, the administration did try to thread a needle here, right? The, if you see in on line 10, page 4, our, our as drafted, the bill um, defines certain bars, crimes of violence, and, and essentially crimes of character. On, on line 17, any other crime you would be able to, to serve on the board. Um, is that the exact right way to go? I don't know. I think you're seeing uh, the indications coming from the Maryland Police Training and Standards Commission that they're going to go a little bit further and stricter. Um, our intent was to ensure that um, folks who serve on this board have a, a clean record within reason. Um, I'll flag for the council that this amendment, while it's more generous on forgiveness, for lack of a better term, on crimes of violence, other crimes have a stricter 10-year um, uh, bar than our draft. So while I think very reasonable people can disagree about what the right place here is um, I think this discussion is valuable. I think it's um, uh, important, and and the administration, while we're comfortable with the way we drafted it, we do understand reasonable people have a different perspective here, and uh, just prefer the draft that is in front of the council uh, without this amendment. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just want to clarify one thing. I did look up um, Chair Rodvian was correct. In 2016, the state changed the voting rights for felons and restored them. So I had to look at that because that's new. Um, but Chief, I had a question about this amendment. If you had a police officer that applied to be a police officer and they had commit, committed a felony 30 years ago, would they be eligible to be a police officer? Absolutely not. And if you had a person who applied to be a police officer and they had commit, committed a, and been convicted of a non-felony crime, but it had been 10 years, would they be eligible to be a police officer? No. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair? Yes, Ms. Lacey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, a person who committed a felony 30 years ago is probably too old to be a police <laughs> officer, first of all. Second of all, if you're <laughs> oh, Ma that would age, be age discrimination. discrimination. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Second of all, I would say that there are plenty of checks and balances to stop a, us from ultimately um, appointing someone who is not qualified due to their character. We've got, uh, you've got, the person has to apply. There will be people within the county executive's office who are sorting through all the applications. They make them available to us as well. They're going to have discussions with us about who they want to appoint. And then the council is going to have the opportunity to meet with all these people ourselves and use our judgment as well as have access to their applications and their criminal background check if that's available at the time of this process happening. So I think there's much less risk that someone who is not qualified by reason of this paragraph uh, is, is actually going to get on the board. But there is a possibility, and because our justice system is based on believing that it's better that you know 10 guilty men 
go free than one innocent man go to jail, and I've represented those innocent men, that is where my perspective comes from. Thank you. All right, I'll just again comment and I truly believe in forgiveness and you know, I think uh, 30 years and, and 10 years after a conviction I think is, um, is gonna, assuming that they're no longer incarcerated, this is well, this is a lot, plenty of time for forgiveness, but um, seeing no further lights. Uh, Madam Secretary, please call on the roll, the roll on amendment number 20. Ms. Lacey. Aye. Ms. Pickard. Nay. Mr. Volke. Nay. Mr. Prusky? Nay. Ms. Fiedler? Nay. Ms. Hare? Nay. Ms. Rodvian? Aye. Two uh, in the affirmative. Sorry? Two I'm in, sorry. Two, two in the affirmative, five in the negative. Amendment number 20 has been defeated. Thank you. Madam Secretary, before we go on, I just want to note the time. It's um, coming up on 11 p.m. And we all know our, our midnight, the clock, you know, we turn into pumpkins at midnight with respect to passing legislation. We have six other pieces. So um, I may be guilty myself. I will try to um, speed up my words and uh, ask my colleagues and um, the county executives representatives to do so as well. With that said, Madam Secretary, please read amendment number 21. Amendment number 21. This amendment removes a reference to the conflicts of interest provisions in code that are applicable to all county employees and instead requires board members to recuse themselves when a conflict of interest exists. Again, this uh, amendment is Ms. Lacey and mine. Uh, Ms. Lacey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think the language in the current bill um, is... I don't know if superfluous is the right word, but implying that you know members of the board need to adhere to every possible um, part of the county code that applies to county employees, I think is is too broad. Unless we're going to actually make them county employees, which is not what's currently in the bill. So I simplified it to the most important part, which is recusing themselves in case of a conflict of interest. Move to adopt. Rodney and second. The administration has a few concerns with this. Understand um, where where the sponsor is coming from. The uh, regardless of whether um, the language of recusal is included in the bill, the the remedy under Article Seven is recusal. Um, so it wouldn't be the end of the world if the council adopted this one, but we ask the council to reject it. We think that um, this board has some very important responsibilities and should be subject to the ethics rules. Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Which ethics rules would someone not be subject to if we were to pass this amendment? Um, what does it open them up to? I'm going to turn it over to Office of Law. Okay, thanks. And I had just turned my light on because I do have a comment on this. So whether we say that they're subject to the ethics laws or not, they're subject to the ethics laws. The definition in Article 7 of employee includes members of boards and commissions. So they would be subject to the entirety of Article 7, whether we say so or not. So we just put it here so anybody... I, my feeling is it's here so that anybody that applies understands they would be subject to everything. And the financial disclosure is, a, is part of that, so. Madam Chair? Yes. Just to, just to respond, so that my intent was not to overall make, uh, reduce those ethics requirements on um, the appointees, but to simplify the language so that you, know, you don't have to go elsewhere to figure out what the heck you're subject to. If you're on this board, you need to recuse yourself. So, thank you. All right, seeing no additional lights from my colleagues, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on amendment number 21. Ms. Lacey. Aye. Ms. Pickard. Nay. Mr. Volke. Aye. Mr. Prusky. Aye. Ms. Fiedler. Aye. Ms. Hare. Aye. Ms. Rodvian. Aye. Six in the affirmative, one in the negative. Amendment number 21 has been adopted. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Please read amendment number 22. Amendment number 22, this amendment prohibits retired law enforcement officers from serving as members of the board. Um, thank you. Again, this is Ms. Lacey and I's um, amendment. Ms. Lacey, if you take this thank one. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, so um, this and the next amendment are on the same theme about the participation of 
retired law enforcement officers serving as members of the board. Um, as you heard, there are plenty of concerns that the uh, PAB as composed in this bill, including the ex officio members, is um, law enforcement management heavy. Um, and so some folks would like to see that there, there a prohibition on a retired law enforcement officer from serving on the board. Um, I think a reasonable compromise is actually the following amendment, which I'll uh, discuss, I guess, when we get there. But I move to adopt. Rod being second. And Mr. Barron. The administration opposes this amendment. Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. If the concern is that the board is management heavy already, and you have a prohibition on anyone who's a retired law enforcement officer who could potentially not be management, they're now not allowed to be on the board. How does that solve the issue of being management heavy? I don't, I don't quite follow that. Madam Chair. Go ahead. Um, I was, ref I did not fully explain. Okay. Uh, I was referring to the ex officios. Gotcha. And that if you have all the ex officios as currently laid out, which I, you know, I have other amendments to address that, <laughs> uh, my bag of tricks, okay? Um, but the, the problem would be we don't have anything saying, you know, how many law enforcement officers, retired law enforcement officers could be on the board at all. And I think everyone would agree that, say, we shouldn't have five law enforcement officers, retired law enforcement officers be on the board. I mean, five out of nine, that's that's definitely not representative of an over-policed community. So I'm looking for a way to limit it. My first option is to is to prohibit them. My second option is a small number. Okay. Yeah. Sure. No additional comments. All right. Um, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on amendment number 22. Thank you. Ms. Lacey. Aye. Ms. Pickard. Nay. Mr. Volke? Nay. Mr. Pruski? Nay. Ms. Fiedler? Nay. Ms. Hare? Nay. Ms. Rodvian? Aye. Two in the affirmative, five in the negative. Amendment number 22 has been defeated. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Please read amendment number 23. Amendment number 23. This amendment limits the number of retired law enforcement allowed as members of the board. Um, again, this is my amendment with Ms. Lacey. Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, this suggests that no more than two members of the board may be retired law enforcement officers. So it gives us a quantity. And the reason I, the way I got to two is uh, suppose you have a meeting of the PAB at which only a quorum is attending, then a quorum is five and you need three votes to pass something. So that's how I got to two, one fewer than three. I move to adopt. Rodby and second. The administration opposes. I actually have a question for Office of Law while we're on this theme. Um, you know, the state law prohibits law enforcement um, members from serving on the PAB at all. Is the ex officio membership somehow exempted? Are we? I guess we're going with a the theory that they're exempted because they're non-voting members. And is that so that? So the state law exempts active police officers as opposed to police officers or law enforcement officers, which would be a broader term. And but so the ex officio, since they don't vote, I think that's correct. That's why you can have. Okay. But 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 it's act. It's police officer versus law enforcement officers. Also part of that, I believe. Could you just tell me a little, like, how are those two terms interpreted differently, law enforcement officer versus police officer? I guess law enforcement officer would include sheriffs, sheriffs and... Uh, yeah, fire investigators would be okay. law enforcement, you know, that kind of thing. And is a, I would assume a chief is considered, a, pol a police chief would be a police officer, yes? No, ma'am, not by statute. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate that there clarification. <laughs> But surely you could do the job. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> of course. All right. Yes, yes, she does. We know she does. She kicks butt. All right. Um, ooh, could I say that on TV? <laughs> all right. Um, all right. Seeing no additional lights from my colleagues, um, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on Amendment Number 23. Miss Lacey. Aye. Miss Pickard. Nay. 
Mr. Volke. Nay. Mr. Pruski. Nay. Ms. Fiedler. Nay. Ms. Hare. Nay. Ms. Rodvian. Aye. Two in the affirmative, five in the negative. Amendment number 23 has been defeated. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Please read amendment number 24. Amendment number 24. This amendment removes all ex officio members from the Police Accountability Board and removes references removes references to non-voting members being reimbursed for expenses incurred. Um, again, this is Ms. Lacey and I's amendment. Ms. Lacey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we've received lots of comments and testimony from various advocate groups who, um, among other things, they requested that the ex officios include representation from their groups. They, another iteration is that they've requested uh, would be to essentially remove all of the law enforcement um, representation uh, to remove uh, the entire ex officios. And so I prepared several amendments um, that we're not going through <laughs> um, on ways to try to find a spot where we might compromise. Um, and because I think it's important that their voices be heard when I said that the issue we were going to have is that um, all the pushback would be, well, if you add one group, then you might have to add this other group. And once you're adding different groups and having to choose who to add, um, you know, where do we, where do you draw that line? Which I believe was also uh, Mr. Barron's words. Where do you draw that line? He's said that to us before. So I think we draw the line at uh, actually deleting the ex officios because those ex officios are going to have all the same access as they would have um, due to the not just the Open Meetings Act and the um, requirement that we've adopted tonight that the board have public comment at its meetings but um, there's no way any any of us should believe that if uh, you know if the chief wanted to come talk to the PAB that the PAB would say no I mean, they have to meet at least quarterly with the heads of law enforcement agencies. That's required by the state bill. Um, and we know they'll also be able to seek out their expertise anytime. But the problem is we can't come up with a way to agree to give the groups who represent many of the people who tend to have this relevant lived experience that we talked about earlier, we can't have them at the table and give them a vote. And we also can't just have them at the table because then we have to have everybody else at the table. So this amendment deletes the ex officios. It basically strikes the table, or at least the extra chairs. I move to adopt. Rod being second. Uh, the administration opposes the uh, understand where the sponsor is coming from. We've we've talked about this at length, um, and, and we'll say the administration has heard advocates, met with advocates, listened to advocates. I think that's why I think the sponsor, Councilwoman Lacey, referenced uh, the amendment. I think it was way back at Amendment Two um, that added the requirement of a public uh, comment. Uh, the ex officio role is uh, at least envisioned uh, while we were drafting this bill a little bit different. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the subject matter experts were, were at the table, but we also didn't want that to be all um, one-sided from law enforcement, which is why you see uh, the county's uh, EDI director and our human relations officer who have their own special skill set and expertise that they'll be bringing to the table. We prefer the bill is drafted. Ms. Pickard. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm going to try to be brief, but if, if you're watching the Charter Review Commission meetings that are happening right now, they only happen every 10 years. The county uh, council appoints <clears throat> a, a very important commission to review our charter. And um, as I've been reviewing their meetings, um, it's really great. Um, if you can't sleep, um, you'll find that they rely heavily on the Office of Law, ex officio members, and our own county council um, executive officer 
to understand the charter and the different functions of government. I, I feel ex officios in this role are play a vital role, and the ones that have been selected, I think, strike that balance that I think all stakeholders are looking for. This is an, a, a real pivotal time in uh, the state of Maryland with police reform, and I think we need to um, be very mindful of uh, the way we form this um, uh, this accountability board. Um, this is going to be, they're going to be doing very important work, and I think they need to be able to bounce off their thoughts and ideas with representatives from the sheriff's office. They do very different work. Representatives from the city of, of, of Annapolis Police Department and our own county uh, department. And then that fantastic balance with our EDI director and our human relations officer, I think, strike that balance and provide um, guidance. So I, I am a no on this one. Thank you. Madam Chair. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I have to say two things about that. First, it's a logical fallacy that um, somehow that because these folks are ex officios, they have any better advice or that they have any more access to be able to give the PAB. It's not like they're not going to attend. Um, and if they weren't going to attend, then I'm sure their uh, superiors would make them attend. But more importantly, this council has bent over backwards twice so far to assure the development community and others who are fearful about the environment um, that our green infrastructure plan is not regulatory. But we can't come up with a way to accommodate what the affected communities want to see for the PAB? Come on. Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is one of those strange situations where the ends of the political spectrum sort of meet each other um, because I, I do actually like this amendment and I support the rationale that Councilwoman Lacey has put out. Um, I think to a certain degree there is a bit of cherry picking that's happening in these ex officio members um, and I do believe that the PAB will still have the ability to get the expertise that they need from some of these law enforcement agencies when they are making decisions regardless of whether these individuals are named as ex officio members or not. I tend to agree that they probably will be in attendance and that the public testimony portion, which we've now added in, provides an opportunity for input from some of these outside um, stakeholders. So with that, I will be supporting this amendment. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just jump in for a second. I'm going to support this amendment, obviously, because my name's on it. But I also am still not 100% set with how we've created the composition of this board. Um, one of the folks who testified earlier said that um, the the one of the under or overriding purposes of this bill is to build trust and accountability, and the process needs to be fair. To build trust and accountability, you need transparency. For it to be fair, you need balance. And when I think about what the purpose of the PAB is, when the main purpose of the PAB is to make recommendations and to look at everything from a, from a, a secondary perspective, I, I worry that we still don't have that balance. I'm working, I'm gonna have something for the next meeting that I hope will address that because I don't think we're there yet. And I think we can do it with ex officio members, um, but, I, Maybe maybe we can do it with the composition of the board, but I think there could be some value conver valuable conversations if we actually bring in some of the advocacy groups and some representation from um, the police or from the law enforcement departments to sit at the table together and talk to each other. So um, anyway, I support this amendment because I think it's better than having things unevenly weighted the way I think they are. Um, but I hope to have something better in the future. So. Ms. Fiedler. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be very quick. Um, I appreciate all the conversation on this amendment. It's a difficult balance, but I do think that the balance has been met in the legislation as drafted, so I, I am not going to be able to support this amendment. All right. Um, thank you. Madam Secretary, please call the roll on amendment number 24. Ms. Lacey. Aye. Ms. Pickard. No. Mr. Volke. Aye. Mr. Prusky. Aye. Ms. Fiedler? Nay. Ms. Hare? Nay. Ms. Rodvian? Aye. Four in the affirmative, three in the negative. Amendment number 24 has been adopted. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Please read amendment number 25. Actually, uh, oh. Madam Chair, I think we can skip to 26 if you agree. Uh, let's see, 25. 
Oh, um, wait, no, we did 24. That was 24 that we just passed. Correct, but I okay. think. So we don't need 25? I don't think we need 25. Okay, then let's, I, that's fine. Okay. I will. So you, would oh. let, you want to withdraw that one and move on to amendment number Do we need 26? to do that it by motion? Well, no, we haven't introduced it, it yet. It hasn't been introduced. No, okay. Right. Mr. Uh, Prusky, do you no, have a... just, just a matter of public record, you have to withdraw it, both the people who have it on the record, say Ms. Lacey and Ms. Rodvian agree but we withdraw. Have, yeah. But it hasn't we been have... introduced. Okay. Right. That's fine. So. So we don't have to rewind because we haven't gone forward. <laughs> okay. I, I couldn't pass my note that fast down, to Madam Chair. <laughs> All, right. All right. So we're moving on to number 26. Um, Madam Secretary, please read amendment number 26. Amendment number 26. This amendment requires the Police Accountability Board elect its own chair and vice chair every three years, which will be, be approved by the County Council via resolution. Um, again, this is Ms. Lacey and I, uh, my uh, amendment, Ms. Lacey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this does what it says. Um, we, on this council, believe it's valuable to have a vice chair, and I think uh, at a minimum, our PAB should have one. Um, but also, I, I thought maybe they could um, essentially elect those two positions from among themselves, but I think state law uh, prefers instead that we have um, have some sort of approval by the county council as a as a check on the board. So that's what this amendment does, and I'm to adopt. Rod being second. Mr. Barron. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, maker of the motion or the amendment and I have had extensive conversations about this approach. The administration has no objection to a vice chair. I think that can be valuable. I think there is some concern as it relates to how this will work practically. Um, understand that uh, the chair of the PAB has certain statutory powers under state law um, that are very important and significant. Um, the administration would be concerned about a situation where the PAB is say deadlocked, it's nine members. What if three people want to be chair and we have three, three, three? Um, it, it just, it sets up a, a, a situation that we're not quite comfortable with. We think the way we drafted the bill where the county council has a say, I don't think it would um, prevent us from surveying the board, but our preference is to have the bill remain as drafted whereby the county executive <coughs> appoints the, the chair and the county council confirms. Um, if there was a, a separate amendment that created a vice chair, we don't think that would be a problem under state law. I am going to ask Office of Law, maybe Mr. Hunt or, or Ms. Uh, Blair Klausmeyer, to weigh in a little bit on some of the nuances around state law as it relates to um, the board selection. Um, sure. Ethan Hunt, Assistant County Attorney with the Office of Law. Um, the only thing I'll add is that state law says the local governing body shall appoint a chair of the Police Accountability Board, and the county charter prescribes what, how local governing body is constructed and interpreted. It says whenever state or federal law confers a power or duty on the county, it refers to the local governing body. Any action required of the county shall be taken by the county executive and then referred to the county council for confirmation. Madam Chair. Go ahead. Excellent. So it sounds like we can adopt this amendment, and we already know that the code is going to require that the county executive <laughs> handles the part before it gets introduced to us. Great. No problem here. Thanks. <laughs> the, office of, the Office of Law would not agree with that. <laughs> 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 Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. That, that acting in concert, that local government piece, we had a lot of discussion about that with respect to masks and what local governing authority was and what the governor had delegated. Um, so just so that I'm clear on this particular amendment in front of us, the concern is that by adding a vice chair position in this manner, we would be running afoul of state law. Is that right? 
of the charter? Yeah. Well, right. the issue Which isn't one? the vice charter chair. Seat. The issue isn't the vice chair. Okay. That, all it's silent the mechanism on that. of the chair appointment. It's the chair appointment. It's the electing a chair, the board electing a, its own chair, and then that just be, being subject to the county council. Okay. So because the state law, this is one of the few things that they have mandated, which is that its local governing body appoints the chair. So by kicking the CE out of the process, we have a problem. You have a problem. Got it. <laughs> and I think the election by the board is a problem. I mean, you could certainly take a recommendation from the board, okay. but, but an actual election is probably a problem. So unfortunately, I, I, my opinion is that anybody who's worked at a small group of people that serves as a board, you want to be able to choose your own leader. To have someone who's not part of that choosing your leader um, can actually, I feel like, can cause some dysfunction within that organization. But hey, if that's what the, if that's what the charter tells us we have to do, um, I might still vote with this on Ms. Lacey's theory of the resolution would be introduced by the county executive. Well, Madam Chair. <laughs> Go ahead. I actually think that between what the bill says and the two amendments we had to um, try to address the issue, that probably we should just withdraw it and fix Rewrite. it for next time. Okay. So I move to withdraw. I second the motion to withdraw. Okay. <laughs> All right. Moving on then to, let's see, that was number 26. Um, Madam Secretary, please read amendment number 27. Amendment number 27, this amendment clarifies that a voting member can serve many terms but may not serve more than two consecutive terms. This again is Ms. Lacey and my um, amendment, Ms. Lacey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm informed by people who focus on boards and commissions that this language is not necessary. <laughs> However, um, I'm, I am a reasonably smart person and I always have to look up this rule <laughs> because I seem to never be able to remember it. It doesn't hurt to make it clear that there's no limit on the number of terms a voting member may serve as long as they take a break. Move to, to adopt. Rodney in second. And Mr. Barron, go ahead. Continuing our search for clarity, we have no opposition. All right. Uh, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on amendment number 27. Ms. Lacey. Aye. Ms. Pickard. Aye. Mr. Volke. Aye. Mr. Prusky. Aye. Ms. Fiedler. Aye. Ms. Hare. Aye. Ms. Rodvian. Aye. Seven in the affirmative, none in the negative. Amendment number 27 is adopted. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Please read amendment number 28. Amendment number 28. This amendment clarifies that the county executive may remove a member for just cause. Madam Chair. Go ahead. Okay, so this is just <laughs> just one word <laughs> being inserted. Um, for, for folks who don't know, non-legal folks, cause is actually more like an abbreviation that has come to be over, over time. It does mean just cause or good cause, but if you're not a lawyer, you might not know that. Um, you can't be you know, fired for an illegal cause, right? That's why we have laws against that. Um, you, if you're going to be removed from the board, then it needs to be for a just cause or a good cause. I like the word just, so I want to put it in there, but this is another amendment aimed at um, helping you know, ensure that ordinary folks understand uh, you know, what are the reasons that you might get um, removed from the board, and also uh, to make sh make clear, it helps make clear that retaliation is not going to be permitted. With that, I move to adopt. Rodby in second. Mr. Barron. Thank you. Uh, so we prefer the bill uh, for cause. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Office of Law because uh, I, Ms. Blair Klausmeyer maybe can do a well, she will do a better job than I. <laughs> oh, certainly. I'll try. Um, I, I appreciate the notion of just cause in an employment situation. I think what we have here is we have appointees. They are not employees. They're not entitled to be members. Um, I think introducing the word just raises a, an, another notch that it's not necessarily needs to be raised to a board member as opposed to an employee. That's my concern about adding the word. I know it's just one word. <laughs> Madam Chair. Go ahead. Just very quickly then. So if we did make PAB members employees, would you want to come back and adjust this section? Um, you mean paid employees? Well, it, it, exempt employees can be dismissed for any reason. I mean, they don't even get cause. So this is even more than what an exempt employee would be entitled to. So. 
Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think my biggest concern with this is, is the idea of what is just cause, like what constitutes that, right? And and just in my mind, because I'm a fan of the West Wing, I, <laughs> I, I think to myself about the Jeb Bartlett line where he says, what's the virtue of a proportionate response, right? Like, so at a certain level, you have to define these things and you have to understand that. And that just kind of triggers for me with this just cause. Not that I don't support the notion of having to have cause, and there has to be some sort of good cause, but my worry is with that concept of just, are we looking to case law? Are we looking to the statutes? Like, where are we looking to determine what's just? And I think we've vested a lot of authority in the county executive already with the including but not limited to language that we did on the immoral conduct um, amendment earlier. So I think that there is a sufficient ability for the county executive to remove someone for cause. But then there's another amendment that I think is coming where they have, the county exec has to say in writing why they dismiss someone. And I think that covers this. I think that that hopefully puts it so that there is some legal onus on the county executive to justify their cause for removal. So I can't support this amendment, but I do like the other amendment. All right, seeing no more lights, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on amendment number 28. Miss Lacey. Aye. Miss Pickard. Nay. Mr. Volke. Nay. Mr. Prusky. Nay. Ms. Fiedler. Nay. Ms. Hare. Nay. Ms. Rodvian. Aye. Two in the affirmative, five in the negative. Amendment number 28 has failed. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Please read amendment number 29. Amendment number 29. This amendment clarifies that the county executive may remove a member for improper use or disclosure of confidential information. Madam Chair. Go ahead. So uh, the law is, or the bill is currently drafted just says uh, information. And I think to a layperson, um, you need to understand that what we're talking about is confidential information. It is information that is protected under the Maryland uh, Public Information Act, which they are later on required. Uh, it's you know in another part of the House bill. So um, I just think it's helpful. It doesn't really change the meaning, but I think it will avoid potential confusion about what a member can or can't disclose. Motion to adopt. Rodby and second. Mr. Barron. So uh, administration opposes um, there might be information that um, should not be disclosed that might not be confidential. Understand the intent of the, the sponsor here. We do want to be careful that we're not um, giving the ability for any future administration to find some pretext to remove someone, which is why we'll also be supporting the amendment that'll be coming that will allow a council to overrule it. Um, I'll turn it over to Office of Law if I'm um, messing up the, uh, the word information. Madam Chair. Go ahead. I just would respond that we're talking about the PAB, which is required to have open meetings. We're not talking about the ACC, which is not required to have open meetings, or a trial board. So most of the information that the PAB will have access to, especially if they don't appoint their own members to the ACC or have that overlap, is going to be information that could be discussed in, in public. And I think for the most part, um, it'll be clear what information they can and can't discuss, but confidential has a meaning under the MPIA. I didn't just make that up or pull that <laughs> out of my hat. Okay, so that's why I think we should use that term. I, I understood, um, Councilwoman, and I'll, I'll let Office of Law jump in, but there are instances where um, certain sensitive or protected information does allow even under the Open Meetings Act to be protected. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Office of Law. Right, I, I agree. Sensitive was the exact word that I was gonna use. There could be information that's sensitive. This, this board is gonna have access to some of that. I think that's the concern. I think that's a concern that's been raised. And while it might be subject to certain, it may not be protected or conf and confidential in the sense of, of that. Um, it may be sensitive, and there are times when meetings can be closed under the Open Meetings Act, and, and so this information may not be publicly discussed. And so that's, I, I think the concern is confidential information is, a, is somewhat limiting of what they could protect or not. So. Madam Chair, may I just briefly respond? Yep. If the administration would prefer that this section say information protected by the MPIA, then we should write that in rather than using a shorthand of confidential information. But I think even to say 
sensitive if what we mean is that the members of the PAB should use some sort of discretion in you know, protecting whatever information they might need to protect that is required to be protected by the MPIA um, or that they can go into closed session. We know they can do those things. At a certain point, that information may not be protected anymore. And so I think, I don't know, I mean, we can agree to disagree or we can come back to this issue, but I don't want to hold everybody up. Yeah, I think the notion is that they somehow take that information outside of the PAB and use it in an improper way. I think that's the concern. Ms. Pickard. Thank you, Madam Chair. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. That that was my thought because the, the the bill as it states now is is not just about disclosure, but it's also about improper use. And I think that's an important caveat in this conversation because it's not necessarily that information may be confidential and shared. Um, uh, it's that the information is improperly used out, whether it's on social media or in some retaliatory way with someone who is testifying before the PAB. I mean, I can't, that's my thought. Thank you. All right. Oh, pardon me. Seeing no additional lights, uh, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on amendment number 29. Ms. Lacey. Aye. Ms. Pickard. Nay. Mr. Volke. Nay. Mr. Prusky. Nay. Ms. Fiedler. Nay. Ms. Hare. Nay. Ms. Rodvian. Aye. Two in the affirmative, five in the negative. Amendment number 29 has been defeated. Madam Secretary, uh, thank you. Please call the, or excuse me, please read amendment number 30. Amendment number 30. This amendment requires that the county executive within 10 days of removal send written notice of the reason for removal and effective date to the chair and vice chair of the board and to the county council. Madam Chair. Go ahead. So Amendment 30 and the next couple of amendments uh, have to do with the removal. Um, this amendment will add a protection um, stating that the county executive has to send notice of the reason for the removal and the effective date thereof. Otherwise, you know, you could just have that, what was that thing Nixon did? It would be like that. <laughs> I move to adopt. Rodby and second. Uh, the administration supports this amendment. I do have one question. I see Mr. Volke's light on, so I'm a little concerned it's the same question. The, the language around vice chair in this amendment, um, maybe I can ask Office of Law in advance, would that pose a problem? I don't think so. Would that pose a problem if we don't actually have a vice chair? Yeah. <laughs> um, Yes, it may, if, they, if we don't have something in the law that says there's a vice chair. <laughs> well, so wouldn't the notice just go to an empty mailbox? It would go to an empty seat, I guess, mm -hmm. yes. So, I mean, I, I don't think it kills the bill. <laughs> The administration supports providing written uh, notice and would support um, a amendment that even as drafted um, in case the board itself decided they wanted a vice chair. Um, so we, we support this amendment and think written notice is a good idea. Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm not sure whether the board has the authority to create their own vice chair, but I do think that next meeting we could come back and clean this up. So I think this amendment makes sense, and if we passed it this way, if we had a problem, we can always just come back and take that language out. Seeing no additional lights, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on amendment number 30. Ms. Lacey. Aye. Ms. Pickard. Aye. Mr. Volke. Aye. Mr. Prusky. Aye. Ms. Fiedler. Aye. Ms. Hare. Aye. Ms. Rodvian. Aye. Seven in the affirmative, none in the negative, and amendment number 30 is adopted. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Please read amendment number 31. Amendment number 31, this amendment adds a provision that the county executive may excuse absences for good cause upon recommendation of the chair of the board. Again, this is uh, Ms. Lacey and Mai's amendment. Madam Chair. Go ahead. This amendment is just uh, an additional check. Um, the, I don't expect that the county executive will necessarily be keeping track of the absences of um, a member of the board, but uh, to remove the possibility of, of a retaliatory removal, then um, I think the recommendation of the chair ensures, requiring the recommendation of the chair ensures that the county executive is informed before he excuses absences or removes someone for absences. 
So I move to adopt. Rodby and second. Mr. Barron. Um, the administration uh, recognizes uh, what's uh, the sponsor's intent here. The concern is what if it's the chair um, that is being removed? So, uh, yeah, I, I think the bill as drafted covers the, the, obviously the county executive would have to find out some way. Um, and so by restricting it that it has to come from the chair, what if it's from the um, executive director or another member of the PAB that brings this issue to, event, uh, to the attention? It'll have to be verified. So I, we don't think this amendment's necessary, but understand where you're getting at here is to, to have a system. We think it'll work out in practice and we don't need to get this prescriptive in law. Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. I guess I'm a little confused about this one. So if we have folks missing significant amounts of meetings, I, I don't know that it's retaliatory to remove them. It seems like it would be appropriate to remove them if they don't want to do the job that they were appointed to do. So I guess that's the question that I have with this is that I'm not following. I've been on boards before where these removal provisions for a certain number of absences have come in. And usually, by the time you get to the place where you're removing someone for the absences, that person is so checked out that you're like, can we just move on from this person and get somebody who wants to be here? So, Madam guess, Chair, that's my question. Go ahead. Uh, I, I agree with you, okay. Mr. Volke. However, if there isn't something like this, then the county executive could just decide to go ahead and remove someone apart from you know, whether or not their uh, absences are excused or not. And I don't think they, that, what I'm trying to do here is add another check, right? So I expect the chair of the board will know what those absences were and were for good cause and can make that recommendation or the vice chair when we have a vice chair. Go ahead. I, I think my only response to that, I understand that check. I think my concern would be if their absence is whether excused or not, their absences. And this person is a necessary part of a functioning board that has very serious work to do. So if you can't make it at a certain level, I think out of courtesy, you should just say, I can't make it. I'm kind of moving on. I, I'm not sure how this serves sort of the purposes of the body, if you will, by saying we can excuse absences. That's my concern with it. Ms. Hare. Thank you, Madam Chair. Jessica Hare, District 7. I think this is a question for Office of Law because I, my understanding with other boards and things that we have, it, it is just if you miss a certain number, you may be removed. And this, upon recommendation of the chair of the board, does not exist as far as I'm aware in like the Women's Commission or the Human Relations Commission. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. This even has a little more than even that because it does have the, the chair notifies the county executive and also puts... Uh, notifies any extenuating circumstances. We don't even usually have that generally in other boards and commissions. It's just if you're absent, you can be removed. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I follow up on Ms. Hare's question? Is that discretionary, though? Like if you've missed, you know, I think the cutoff is 25% of the meetings, say you've missed 35%, but um, are they required to remove you, or is it up to the yeah, I, I think whoever appointed? Yeah, I think even if it's not stated about extenuating circumstances, I'm sure that can be that can be taken. I think it, I think most of them say the county executive may um, remove for absences. So I think it can be taken. It's just not as explicit in most of the boards and commissions as it is here. On, on page five, line 23, it is may. Thank you. Ms. Lacey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I do think it's possible a county executive could decline to use his discretionary authority to remove someone from the board who ought to be removed. Hence, trying to come up with something, but maybe this isn't it, so. All right, oh, Ms. Fiedler. Thank you, Madam Chair, Amanda Fiedler, District 5. How many meetings are required by the board in a year? Um, this, and I'll defer to Mr. Hunt, but it's, um, they have to, by state law, have to meet at least quarterly, but may meet more as required. Thank you. Madam Secretary, please call the roll on amendment number 31. Ms. Lacey. Aye. Ms. Pickard. Nay. Mr. Volke. Nay. Mr. Pruski. Nay. Ms. Fiedler. Nay. Ms. Hare. Nay. Ms. Rodvian. Aye. <coughs> Two in the affirmative, five in the ne negative. Amendment number 31 has been defeated. 
Thank you. Madam Secretary, please read amendment number 32. Amendment number 32. This amendment allows a removed board member to be reinstated by a resolution of the County Council adopted by the affirmative vote of five members. Um, again, this is Ms. Lacey and my amendment, Ms. Lacey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is exactly what it says, um, adding the ability for the County Council to reinstate a person that the County, Con that the county Executive removed. Um, you may say, why is that important? Well, I think if you're imagining a circumstance where your county executive maybe was up to no good, and we've had one of those before, so let's just say. Um, well then, I don't know that I necessarily want to trust what that person did when they want to remove a member of the Police Accountability Board. Um, and since the county council is supposed to uh, approve uh, so many of the other things that involving the PAB and those appointments, I think it's appropriate to have a mirror image sort of power over removal. I don't expect we would use it, but I tried to think of what would be like a minimum reasonable period of time. So I have two business meetings so that we could investigate and decide, you know, to bring a resolution or not. So move to adopt. Rodney and second. Administration strongly supports. We've referenced this before. This is a good check on executive power. All right, seeing no additional lights, uh, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on amendment number 31. Ms. Lacey. Uh, number 32. Oh, 32, 32. Um, aye. Ms. Pickard. Aye. Mr. Volke. Aye. Mr. Prusky. Aye. Ms. Fiedler. Aye. Ms. Hare. Aye. Ms. Rodvian. Aye. Seven in the affirmative, none in the negative. Amendment number 32, 32 has been adopted. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Read amendment number, oh, excuse me, please read amendment number 33. I'm getting so fast, I'm skipping my manners. <laughs> amendment number 33. This amendment requires the board to meet monthly or more often as needed. Again, this is Ms. Lacey and my amendment. Ms. Thank Lacey. you, Madam Chair. Real quick, uh, I thought that the state law requiring quarterly meetings with law enforcement and call the chair as needed was just not enough structure overall for this, this group. So uh, at least monthly seems more reasonable to me. Move to adopt. Rodney and second. Um, Mr. Brown. Yeah, uh, appreciate this. Have no um, issue with adding a requirement of more frequent meetings. I do want to flag our concern with this amendment relates to the removal of the ad hoc ad hoc, I think that's the right, yeah, there we go, um, ad hoc ability of the board to uh, call meetings. So I think if we did it as an and, monthly and the ability would have the administration feeling a little more comfortable about this, but um, uh, monthly is is probably good. I think this board has a lot of important work to do. Um, there's nothing in the state law that prevents um, they will have met the requirement that they meet quarterly. So I think we're okay legally with this. Just want to flag, we would prefer it if we had kept line f that part and just tacked this on. Madam Chair. Uh, go ahead. Isn't it sort of implied that the chair can call a meeting or that a majority of the board could call a meeting? I mean, other things we haven't put in because <laughs> They're implied. This particular thing, I think, already it's already there. In we matters. Yeah, I mean, we structured it to have a, a requirement, so I'm going to defer to Office of Law in case I'm being too um, concerned here. So the question is whether they could meet, whether we say it or not, um, as long as they met their requirement to at least meet quarterly with the law enforcement, then. Um, they can meet whenever they want. Yep. Okay, we're good. Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chief, how frequently does the command staff meet now for this type of meeting that you all are having where you're looking at discipline and you're trying to make determinations of what to do? Because obviously this is sort of superseding what you do with your staff now. Um, when reviewing disciplinary matters, yeah. that was your question? Yes, um, thank you. Frequently, frequently, more, more so than monthly. Okay, so then I guess my question to follow up on that would be, do you have any opposition to this provision put in, being put in here to say monthly meetings? I, I don't want to create useless work. I don't want to force this board to meet if they don't need to meet. But if you're telling me there's enough work to justify it, then it seems to make sense. 
There is, however, um, I think the way that the law is currently written, it provides for that as needed, okay. correct? I, I think that it's there, but this is sort of setting a different minimum threshold. You don't have to answer it. That wasn't really a question, more of a statement. Thank you. Ms. Pickard. So as the, the way HB 670 has structured the work of police accountability into the PAB, the ACC, and the, the trial board, or now the hearing board um, in Anne Arundel County. Are we, sh while command staff may meet frequently about police discipline, are we, are we conflating the work of all three of these into just the PAB? I'd hate to require them to meet monthly if there's a couple months where they don't need to meet when the bill states they're going to meet quarterly and as needed by the request. I kind of like the way it's written now, I think. I'm answering my own question. Uh, uh, Ms. McCoy wanted to add something. <laughs> this one. Only that uh, I believe the state's intent uh, was for uh, the accountability board to research, look at data, and then raise conclusions on that. I just think that if you draw conclusions off monthly data as opposed to quarterly data, and then you're talking about all five uh, different agencies and, and how that relates to discipline, that monthly may be just an overstretch. I think that their intent was for you to get enough information to make rational decisions. Madam Chair. I don't know who was first. Go ahead, Ms. Pickard. So, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. Ms. McCoy. Ms. McCoy, thank you. Um, so do I understand you that you believe, you, you're you advocating then for a, a monthly standing meeting of the PAB, or the opposite? The opposite, ma'am. I think okay. that it should, it should remain the same. It should remain the, the way that the state had written it, because if you read there, if you uh, uh, look at their language, they want you to um, research you know, data, trends. I don't think that you can draw conclusions about a trend in a I, month. I see what you're saying. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you. Seeing no other red lights, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on amendment number 33. Miss Lacey. Aye. Miss Pickard. Nay. Mr. Volke. Aye. Mr. Prusky. Nay. Miss Fiedler. Nay. Miss Hare. Nay. Miss Rodvian. Aye. Three in the affirmative, four in the negative. Amendment number 33 has been defeated. Before we go on, um, and noting the time and knowing there's some, uh, possibly some other important bills that needed, need a vote before midnight tonight, um, we would like to, I don't know, I don't know if this requires a motion, but um, Ms. Lacey and I have agreed to hold our amendments over until, for introduction, until we can't do that. Okay. You're going to need to talk to your parliamentarian. You're in the middle of a, you have a, an open thing going on Public right now. Hearing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, with your, with 1622. So I don't know, I know that you can table it, but then you can't take it up until another session. I'm not certain what other kind of motion you could do to temporarily do, do something, but that's what I know. So, okay, then I will <laughs> turn my question to Madam <laughs> Parliamentarian. Is, is there a way to, um, you know, um, take all of the remaining amendments and hold them over until the 21st. You haven't introduced any of them. So right? then they're we should still, be able to do that, right? They're still out there. So you would need to uh, wrap up right now and be done with amendments. It's basically what you would need to do. And you need to close out 1622. Am I wrong? Close out, you close by doing the rest of the amendments? You would need to stop where you are, and any amendments that we have not gotten to, we simply reintroduce next time. That's what I think she's saying. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'd like to yeah. do. Okay. I'm sorry. I misunderstood you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Not not break and come back. That's... Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes. So, yeah, we have 15 minutes left to, to do lots of legislative business, and we did advertise public hearings for this legislative day. Yes. So... 
so there are a handful that are not Ms. Lacey and I, so I don't know if our colleagues I would be Just comfortable for, with that. Madam Chair? Yes. For clarification, I'm not sure which bill is time sensitive this evening. It's, I don't think we, we don't have any um, expiring bills, but we have folks in the audience and possible public testimony on other, on the six other bills. Well, we're not going to get to six other bills, but we should at least try to get to. Um, Madam Chair. Go ahead. I, I appreciate the discussion, but I think if we try to start getting through the rest of the agenda, we're not going to give ample time to the other legislation. We're going to just rush through everything, and I don't think that that's ideal. Go ahead, Ms. Chair. I, I know we can't vote on the other uh, items after midnight, but I thought we could still hear public testimony after okay. midnight on the other bills. So the okay. fact that there's folks here for the other bills, I don't, I don't think that that's an issue. We just can't take any votes. We can still open the public hearing. So there aren't any votes that feel critical for tonight? I don't think any bills are expiring. I don't think there's anything to None is, We don't have anything expiring until May. Right. All right, then we shall proceed. Um, Madam Secretary, please read amendment number 34. Amendment number 34. This amendment requires the executive director to be an attorney to manage the staff assigned to the board and to provide legal counsel to the board. Requires the executive director to assist with staffing for the administrative charging committee and trial boards and allows the executive director to provide legal counsel to the administrative charging committee. Um, again, this is Ms. Lacey and my amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this does what the description says. Um, the, everyone knows the advocacy groups were asking for the Police Accountability Board, accountability board to have um, and its own independent council. Um, I thought it would be a good compromise to make the executive director have to be an attorney so that they could fulfill that role. Um, and you know, part of being an attorney would be managing the uh, the staff assigned to the board for the board's work, their contractual services, and providing legal counsel to the board. I move to adopt. Rodby and second. Um, so the administration strongly supports um, the concept of requiring the executive director to be an attorney and provide uh, legal assistance to the board. Uh, we do have a couple of concerns with um, how this amendment is drafted and prefer some of the alternatives that are out there. Um, the particular concerns relate to um, the um, language around the investigation of complaints. Obviously, uh, the, the PAB doesn't investigate complaints. In, administrative charging co committees and trial boards are separate entities under state law. Um, by providing the PAB executive director with oversight responsibilities might not quite jive with state law. Um, so the, the executive director is a, a county uh, employee, um, but the administrative charging committees and trial boards are not technically county bodies. Um, so our, our preference is um, to, to make the executive director be required to be an attorney, but maybe not include some of the other uh, parts of this amendment. Uh, Ms. Fiedler. Oh, my apologies. All right, seeing no other lights, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on amendment number 34. Ms. Lacey. Aye. Ms. Pickard. Nay. Mr. Volke. Nay. Mr. Prusky. Nay. Ms. Fiedler. Nay. Ms. Hare. Nay. Ms. Rodvian. Aye. Two in the affirmative, five in the negative. Amendment number 34 has been defeated. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Please read amendment number 35. Uh, Madam Chair, I believe you may have a complication with, I think, um, amendment number 24. If you look back on that, um, 
not certain. I think it's actually the other way around. I think um, uh, com or reimbursement is covered for ex officio members, but not for voting members, if so, I recall. So we're making sure that voting members can get reimbursement as well. In amendment number 24 on page 6 in line 29, you struck non-voting and, and substituted voting. So, so there is... No, oh, 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 I no see. No more non voting mean. to strike. So you would be saying voting and voting, I believe, is what I'm seeing. But sorry, my, I'm, it's close to midnight here. Anybody see what I'm seeing? So we should maybe come back to this and rewrite it to fit with the previous come back to this one and madam chair I think actually it's just that we've already done this amendment now because the other one passed oh, because it has language about reimbursement what am I missing because to, I'm sorry uh, 24 took out non-voting because there were are no more ex officio members right so then this one is unnecessary because there are no non-voting members correct is that right so okay. we don't need this one <laughs> we can go on okay I think I had it the other way around in my head. All right, um, Madam Secretary, please read the amendment number, read amendment number 36. Amendment number 36. This amendment allows childcare and transportation costs to be eligible for reimbursement if necessary to attend a scheduled hearing, scheduled meeting of the board. Again, this is Ms. Lacey in my amendment. Ms. Lacey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so this may start a conversation. I mean, we don't necessarily provide um, explicitly anywhere else in the code that members of our boards or commissions could be reimbursed for the cost of child care and transportation necessary to attend a scheduled meeting. And I think we could also you know, improve attendance while also um, uh, supporting the diversity of applicants that we hope to have on the PAB, uh, the diversity city of life experiences and frankly income levels so with that I move to adopt Rodney and second um, at the administration uh, understands uh, the sponsors intent here and and actually think this is an important discussion to have as it relates to um, people's ability to participate in civic activities um, the the administration would just flag for the council that once you start doing this, um, we're going to have to do this others, and maybe that's uh, uh, something that the council is willing to do. Um, but it will. Um, we cannot estimate the fiscal cost. Um, not quite sure how childcare is defined. What counts? Is it the neighbor, or is it um, a fancy um, uh, summer camp? <laughs> Um, so just uh, want to flag this is an important issue to make sure that we can have folks of all means serving on this. Appreciate the intent. Not sure if, um, not sure we can predict the cost, so we'll defer to the council if you want to roll those dice. Um, since I'm a co-sponsor here, I would just argue that, you know, in all kinds of expenses, we have, you know, reasonableness as a standard. You know, um, we, we're not going to reimburse your $100 stretch limo for <laughs> your transportation to your meeting or, you know, to go from uh, one place to another. You're, you're going to get, like, the per mileage rate or whatever. So we could, I think we could come up with a reasonable compromise here. I'm sure we can. Yeah. Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Barron, we're... Chief, is do we currently reimburse the cost of child care for police officers or other emergency personnel when they are going to work or meetings or things like that? No, sir. I don't believe that provision is covered in our okay. um, uh, FOP contract either. Okay. That's an excellent idea, though. Thank you. Um, Ms. Pickard? Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I... I fully understand um, the, the intent of this amendment. I do have some concerns about how many boards and commissions we have, uh, including our boards of appeal. But I, but, so I don't want this just to be about a, a budget uh, line. Um, 
is it possible to come back to this issue when we are tackling the budget, or do we need to add this language in the bill? Uh, because we have about 30 boards of, and commissions. At least. Yeah. Madam Chair. It's a concern. Uh, go ahead, Ms. Lacey. I just, uh, to Ms. Pickard's point, um, we would have to start somewhere, um, clearly, and this is only about this bill. Um, so, I, I mean, I don't think it would be very, very much I mean, from what we've been talking about so far, although we can't know. But really, the main thing to me is that, um, at least I know from my own personal experience, that if I... I didn't have an express benefit that I could uh, ask for to be reimbursed for childcare or transportation. I wouldn't ask. And I probably, if I were um, a person whose economic situation was you know, marginal and, and day to day, then I, I literally would not be doing extra things like boards and commissions if I had to pay for childcare and transportation, which can be substantial, especially if they have to cross the county. Madam Chair, go ahead. I think my, my thought process is, is a little different in that if we choose to take the route of the Board of Appeals uh, and those members are stipend um, while they're not necessarily making a salary, it's an understanding that that stipend is to sort of to cover those, those, expensive of, those expenses of service. Um, but we haven't made that decision yet until we get to our, our budget um, deliberations about fulfilling this. So I would lean more towards a stipend PAB board modeled after our Board of Appeals that would save us from opening a can of worms that we can't really tackle. If um, I point out to the council the the uh, bill line, page six, line 26, does allow for compensation of members. So if the council wanted to go sort of the quote unquote board of appeals route, um, that would be a conversation the administration would be willing to have. Madam Chair. Go ahead. Uh, so when I served on the, the board of education, I viewed that uh, $6,000 as more of a stipend and covered expenses like that. It wasn't necessarily a salary, right? Because obviously as you, uh, $6,000 a year is not a salary. Uh, but it did pay for babysitters when my husband was traveling, uh, for sure. Um, I'm, I'm just leaning more towards a stipend uh, situation than a reimbursement situation. Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I think Mr. Prusky, being a former Board of Appeals member, could speak to this more eloquently than I can. However, I do understand their workload is different than what we're contemplating for this board. I think they're meeting multiple times a week. They're doing site visits. They're going out and doing investigations, which is not what we're contemplating this board to do. Um, so I'm not saying that a stipend is something we shouldn't talk about or we shouldn't look at, but I do think that when we're sort of looking at the scope of what we're asking people to do, this is not really an apples to apples comparison talking about the Board of Appeals versus this board, because I think the workload is substantially different. Madam Chair. Ms. Lacey. Uh, thank you. I just want to emphasize that this amendment is not, it's not about whether it's a stipend or a reimbursement, although it is in the section on reimbursement, because that's where it seemed to make sense um, when I wrote it. It's an illustration that's very explicit about a kind of expense that can be reimbursed, and it's about acknowledging the barriers that uh, women um, and people of color and people of low income face to be able to equitably participate on a board. A stipend doesn't address that issue because it goes to everyone equally unless they renounce it or something. So it's to me very appropriate and um, forward thinking. Madam Chair, can I make a comment? I'm just concerned about an unintended consequence. We have with with several, at least, boards and commissions language that's similar to this related to reimbursed for expenses incurred related to their duties. And I would say that means if you have to make photocopies or go out and buy a book or something that you would have to do. And my concern is that calling child care and transportation in this bill for this board a 
and expense related to their duties that we may run into issues with other boards and commissions who now want to say the same thing even though the language isn't this explicit. So why? So. I'm, I'm just suggesting that if the notion is you do want to reimburse for this, that you not relate it, not have it be expenses related to their duties. Uh, that's just my only concern, that there may be some unintended consequence here by, by doing it this way. Um, it might be a separate sentence or something that doesn't relate it to that. That's my only concern. I just wanted to point that out because it does appear multiple times in the code. Madam Chair. Go ahead. I think we can't vote on these on this amendment. It's midnight. Oh, oh, that's what you were showing me. I saw something else on your phone. You were trying to show me the time. I was like, I don't even know what he's doing. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, I'm getting tired and punchy. Okay, so yes, we have reached the witching hour. Go ahead, ma'am. Go ahead. interrupting, but maybe I missed it. Was amendment number 35 formally withdrawn? Well, we just skipped it. It was never introduced. We determined that we were not going to introduce it. All right. So, and so we cannot vote on 36 because we have reached the midnight yeah. hour. M Madam Chair, for the benefit of the public, because I ahead. think some people yes. need to know. Go ahead, Mr. Priesky. Um, <laughs> in the rules, a bill or amendment to a bill may not be voted upon unless it's during a legislative session. Our rules are at midnight. It's reached midnight. So I just want to be clear that we cannot vote on a bill or an amendment, just so everyone understands. That's not that we don't want to continue. It's that we are prohibited from continuing by our rules. Thank you. All right, so at this point, um, these uh, prospective amendments, because they're not amendments yet, but prospective amendments, um, we will introduce them on March 21st. Uh, yes, and to be clear, the public hearing was held and closed. Okay. So when we come back at the next March meeting, it's, it's a little bit like when you hold the vote. We'll okay. come back next time in the same way. Okay. And pick up those amendments. All right, thank you for your um, parliamentarian help. So at this point then, we will move on to bill number 17-22, and at this point we'll have public hearings and hear from the panelists and discuss the bills, but we will not vote. Is that correct? Uh, or? I, I'm not certain because we, we advertise these bills, we advertise them specifically as public hearings being held on March the 7th, legislative day number six, I think it is. Mm -hmm. So we have now reached the expiration of leg legislative day number six. It's no longer March 7th. So, I mean, I think in the past when we've had this happen, what we've done is call the, for the public hearing, but you don't close it, continue it until March 21st. We'll have to re-advertise it and all that good stuff. So allow folks that are here to testify, yeah, to just, testify tonight. You can only and then, open the public hearing okay. and you can't do anything legislative. Okay. Well, that sounds, but we can still discuss and debate um, amongst ourselves and uh, sure, input can, from the county yeah, executive. You, if you okay. still want to have your discussion. Okay. Just I'm sure everyone's at this point going to be very willing to keep it brief. Yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Persky. Again, Madam Chair, per the rules, what I would just state is that the public hearing will continue to the next meeting so people understand that as a part of the record. Thank you. Public hearings don't have to be held on a legislative day. That's in the, in the charter. But we advertised it as such. So normally what we do is we just, you hold it, you open it, and you keep it open, basically. And you continue it. That's kind of what we call it. Does that make sense to everybody? Was it advertised to be held public hearing on the 7th? March the 7th. It's not the 7th anymore. That's correct. But because the charter says we don't have, that we can have hold public hearings, so it's really up to the council. If you you can ha you can start it now and you can continue it until next time. That's just usually what we do. I'm sorry. One other consideration is that I would think that many people who do want to vote on any of these bills aren't here anymore. So, I mean, I guess if you continue the hearing until next the next meeting, basically be starting all over again. Anyway, I think it's up to you. Madam Chair. Yes. Would it be possible, given that it's past midnight, to then just say, anybody who is here, can we just sort of in bulk open the public hearings for all the remaining bills and have them just come up and tell us what they, because we're going to hold them all open anyway. 
but they're still individual hearings. Yeah, you do. I think you do have to go through each bill. So I would just okay. say go through the exercise of doing the public hearing, and, and then we continue the public hearing until March 21st. And by default, you can't do anything legislative, including voting, until March 21st. It, so do you suggest that we skip all the other pieces of it, the, you know, the discussion, the, well, I think we have a combination of admin bills and council bills, you know, discussion from the council members and the admin team. If I, if I may, Madam Chair, just to add more, the administration is comfortable. However, the council decides, I do want to fly. We do have one resolution and that a resolution does not turn into a pumpkin. Right. Yeah. We, we were going to get to that in just a second. We get, you can do fully do resolution number 422, which is okay. a very exciting resolution. <laughs> Uh, honestly, right. I, I do. I think that you have a lot of things happening by default here, and you can call it what you want to call it. <laughs> I right. think that it should be up to the will of the council here. All right. So then, in that case, um, Madam Secretary, please read the title of Bill Number 17-22. Bill Number 17-22, an ordinance concerning planning and development master plan for water supply and sewerage systems. All right, and this is an administration bill. Oh my goodness. <laughs> they've, they've been here the whole time, so we should let them have their turn. <laughs> um, this is an administration bill. So. Yes, yeah, so I've got Mr. Sheknovich. I've got uh, Mr. Kai Ziegler is still hanging around. Uh, Ms. Carrier, Ms. Williams, uh, Mr. Murphy, Mr. Herb, Ms. Kenny, and I think I got everybody. If I didn't, please speak up because y'all hung around. Um, so uh, this bill, 1722, uh, relates to the master plan for water and sewage. We discussed this at the work session. This is for the West County Elementary School site in order to qualify for IAC funding, and Mr. Sheknovich can tell us more. We need to have that site in our plan. This bill amends our plan and puts that site so we can get $16 million in state funding for our school. Thank you. For the record, Alex Shekno is Chief Operating Officer for the school district. Uh, as Mr. Barron indicated, that is correct under the state smart growth policies. Uh, they uh, strongly encourage, uh, with financial incentives, to connect schools to public utilities. Uh, this school is located in a very environmentally sensitive area. It's also heavily surrounded by floodplains, so perking and having a uh, public school with 550 plus uh, students going into a septic system is probably not anything anybody wants. Plus we get almost $16 million from the state. So I would urge the uh, council's consideration at their next meeting. Thank you. Any questions while we've got this wonderful panel? All right, um, we will now open the public hearing on bill number 17-22. Madam Secretary, do we have any testimony received from members of the public? No, Madam Chair, we did not receive any submissions of testimony ahead of time. All right, we will now invite members of the audience who signed up before the meeting to address the council on bill number 17-22. Remarks will be limited to two minutes. We did not have anyone signed up ahead of time, but if there's anyone here who wishes to speak, you may come to the table, state your name and address for the record. The public hearing on bill number 17-22 will be held open until March 21st. All right, at this time, we will move on to bill number 18-22. Do I need to do anything else to close out 17-22? I don't think so, I think you All right, thank you very much. Madam Secretary, please read the title of bill number 18-22. Bill number 18-22, an ordinance concerning finance, taxation, and budget, opioid abatement special revenue fund. This is another admin bill. Mr. Barron, you have the floor. Yep. Uh, so I have Ms. Blair Klausmeyer and hopefully Mr. Taru He's is right asleep. Behind you. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, thank you for hanging around, sir. Uh, so 1822 establishes the Opioid Abatement Special Revenue Fund. As you all know, there's a national settlement. We need a place for the money to land. Maryland's going to receive about $337 million. 
in. We're not quite sure what our share will be, but we know it will be significant. The money will be used um, as it's allowed under the agreement. And Mr. Taru can give us um, any additional information that I missed. All right. Seeing no uh, lights on, um, we will now hold the public hearing on bill number 18-22. Madam Secretary, do we have any testimony received from members of the public? No, Madam Chair, we did not receive anything ahead of time. Thank you. Um, we will now invite members of the audience who signed up before the meeting, except we did not have anyone who signed up before the meeting. But if there is anyone here who wishes to testify on 18-22, you may come up to the table now, state your name and address for the record, and you will have two minutes. Seeing no movement in the audience, the public hearing on bill number 18-22 will be held over until March 21st, 2022. And we will now move on to bill number 19-22. Bill number 19-22, an ordinance, con an ordinance concerning aggregate net energy metering, metering credit purchase agreement, Glen Burnie Landfill Solar LLC. Thank you, and this is another admin, admin bill, Mr. Barron. Um, you may have the floor, and I see your team is joining you. Yep, got a bunch of experts here. Um, we have uh, Mr. Johnston, Mr. Ergo, Mr. Ulster, Ms. Anderson, and Ms. Blair Klausmeyer. Um, again, uh, this one was the one discussed at the work session. This is... Uh, I'll just say it because it's past midnight. It's a really cool thing. We're going to put solar panels on an unused landfill and turn it into money for the county. You should support this at the appropriate time. All right. Um, seeing no questions from my council, we will now open the public hearing on bill number 19-22. Madam Secretary, do we have any testimony received from members of the public? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Actually, we received one submission of testimony that went to the entire council. It's included in the summary that's posted online, and it's also being added to the record. Thank you. We will now invite members of the audience who signed up beforehand. Again, we did not have anyone who signed up beforehand, but if there is anyone here who wishes to speak on Bill 19-22, you may come up to the table and state your name and address for the record. You will have two minutes. Seeing no motion in the audience, we will hold the public hearing on Bill number 19-22 open until March 21st. And at this time, I'll say thank you. Um, and we will move on to bill number 20-22. And this is Mr. Prusky's bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I want to remind everyone that the council appointed members to serve on a salary commission. Uh, this commission uh, is chosen every four years to make recommendations to the county council. Uh, per law, the county council cannot raise their current salary. It happens to the next council. So whether you win or you're leaving, uh, like myself, I will not be returning. Um, but essentially this bill brings forward the recommendations of the salary commission. Uh, the commission, again, is representatives from each councilmatic district. And the commission recommended the following, a 2.5% increase uh, for every four years. The commission also recommended lowering council member portion of health insurance costs to 50% from 100%. I do want to add that I was considering a charter amendment, um, and this relates to employee bargaining, um, that essentially says that the bill drafted would be lesser of the 2.5% or the COLA. Um, for county employees, and that's something that I added. Again, I was considering a charter amendment, but I also think that whatever this council get, gets paid uh, should be in line with the lowest bargaining unit, uh, in my opinion. And again, that's my opinion, um, and essentially that's it. Uh, but again, this is what the Salary Commission uh, brought forward, and I do want to reiterate, this is not raising current salary. It will be the next council that serves, uh, and again, these are the recommendations from them, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, since this is a strictly council bill, um, are there any questions from my colleagues for the sponsor? All right, seeing none, we will now open the public hearing on bill number 20-22. Madam Secretary, do we have any testimony received from members of the public? 
Uh, Madam Chair, I think I should read the title of the bill real quick. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, I'll do that first. Bill number 2022, an ordinance concerning legislative branch compensation benefits. And no, we did not receive any testimony ahead of time. Thank you. We will now invite members of the audience who signed up beforehand. Once again, we did not have anyone uh, signing up beforehand, but if there's anyone who would like to speak on this bill, you may come up to the table now. Seeing no one moving in the audience, we will hold the public testimony open on this bill until March 21st, 2022. Um, all right, moving on to bill number 21-22. Madam Secretary, please read the title of bill number 21-22. Bill number 21-22, an ordinance concerning subdivision and development and zoning cluster development. Ms. Fiedler, this is your bill. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Amanda Feather, District 5. So this is um, obviously a cluster bill. Um, this is not the first cluster bill that a county council has seen. This is probably the fourth or fifth, maybe even sixth bill. Um, in, in essence, it consolidates and reorganizes cluster language in Article 17 and 18, updates and expands the definition of cluster, adds cluster to the residential use chart as a conditional use in RA through R5, sets forth a condition conditions and adds prohibitions to certain modif modifications. We discussed this bill during our work session. I acknowledge that there are tweaks and knobs that needed to, need to be adjusted. Unfortunately, we are unable to do that this evening. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Barron. Uh, nothing to add other than echoing uh, the sponsors. Uh, I guess maybe I'll put it in my words. Bill still has some work to do, willing to work together to, to get there. I think the knobs were your words. I just took them. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Seeing no lights, we will now open the public hearing on bill number 21-22. Madam Secretary, do we have any testimony received from members of the public? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Actually, we did, and I'm also going to correct the record. The, the piece that was submitted was for 21-22, not 19-22, as I previously stated. There was one submission that was received. It went to the entire council. It's included in the summary that is posted online and is added to the record. Thank you. All right. Um, we will now invite members of the audience who signed up before the meeting to address the council on bill number 21-22. Remarks will be limited to two minutes. And Stephen Miller is still here. I think he deserves a round of applause. Well, good morning, uh, Mayor and council members. And, and I really admire you for uh, continuing into this late hour. I'm Steve Miller. I'm the 613 Samantha Court. And I'm a homeowner of, in a plan unit development. It's essentially a cluster development composed of a mix of townhouses and single family homes. As a member of our original board of directors, I began raising concerns with the county back in 2014 about issues with easements, challenges with road design, encroachment of stormwater management practices on private lots, and drainage problems overall. I saw what was being done with so many different requirements being shoehorned. Rundle County. So I have a pretty good basis of comparison. The current code has allowed extreme variations in lot size and design in many communities, giving the impression that cluster is more about increasing density of homes than preserving natural features and open space. Small lots in cluster developments have been made even smaller by sometimes being encumbered with stormwater best management practice or drainage swales that have left little room for play or for owners to install decks or patios and landscape or hardscape after setbacks are factored in. In some cases, road drainage swales have been put in the front of lots that take up most of that front lot. The cluster developments seem to have once promised open space and active recreation areas that would mitigate the limitations of small lots. However, that has not happened. Clusters have been built on parcels way too small to not only provide adequate recreational space, but much of the open space can be taken up by numerous stormwater best management practices. The county has certainly seen this, but can't do much unless the code is changed. And I think the administration is interested in seeing some course corrections made. 
Councilwoman Fiedler has taken an important step in Bill 2122 towards addressing some of the key issues associated with cluster development. And I urge your support for this bill. And thank you for letting me go over my two minutes. <laughs> thank you very much. Actually, I'd like to ask you just one quick question. What's the sure. name? Just, uh, you know, so I have a, a, an example to work with. What's the name of your, um, your subdivision again? Deep Creek Village. Deep Creek Village. Thank yes. you very much. And, and I welcome you to come out and see it. <laughs> thank you. We're very proud of our community. Awesome. Um, all right. If there's anyone in the audience that would like to come down and speak, now would be your time. Seeing no additional movement in the audience, we will hold open the public hearing on Bill 21-22 until March 21st, 2022. Um, any further? Oh, I think I think we're good then. Okay. Um, all right. Moving on to Resolution 4-22. Madam Secretary, please read the title of Resolution Number 4-22. Resolution Number 4-22. Resolution selecting S and SB and Company LLC, an independent firm of certified public accountants, to perform the financial audit for fiscal year 2022. Uh, Ms. Belair. Uh, Michelle Belair, County Auditor. We completed a procurement last year for a qualified certified public accounting firm licensed in the state of Maryland to perform the financial audit of the Anne Arundel County Annual Comprehensive Financial Report, perform a single audit on the schedule of expenditures of federal awards, and to potentially perform other services as requested. The independent CPA firm that performed the financial audit of fiscal year 2021 was SB and Company. They're a Maryland headquartered minority business enterprise. They are a certified public accounting and business advisory firm primarily serving the Mid-Atlantic region. They are currently working on the single audit for fiscal year 2021. Uh, the evaluation committee is recommending that SB and Company perform the aforementioned audits for fiscal year 2022. We are requesting your approval of our recommendation. All right, thank you. Are there any questions from my colleagues? All right, seeing none, Madam Secretary, do we have any testimony received from the public? We did not receive anything, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, at this time, we will invite members of the audience. We did not have anyone signed up ahead of time, but if there is anyone here who wishes to speak, please come up to the table, state your name and address for the record. Seeing no movement in the audience, um, shall we, do we need to hold this one over? No. 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 Okay, so. All right, um, then the public hearing on Resolution 4-22 is now closed. Madam Secretary, please read the title of Resolution Number 4-22. Resolution Number 4-22, Resolution Selecting SB and Company LLC, an independent firm of certified public accountants to perform the financial audit for fiscal year 2022. All right, um, Mr. Wolf, no, you're ready to vote. All right, I think everybody's ready to vote. All right, Madam Secretary, please call the roll on Resolution Number 4-22. Ms. Lacey. Aye. Ms. Pickard. Aye. Mr. Volke. Aye. Mr. Proust. Aye. Ms. Fiedler. Aye. Ms. Hare. Aye. Ms. Rodvian. Aye. Seven in the affirmative, none in the negative. Resolution number 422 is adopted. Um, before we go on to the, you know, ask for about other business, I just want to give a big shout out to um, Ms. Schultz and uh, Ms. Corby. Um, Ms. Schultz, just Ms. Schultz. Ms. Schultz, maybe others, um, who did an enormous amount of work preparing um, all the amendments. Um, that was a, a huge part of our meeting tonight. Um, so thank you. We really appreciate your work. At this time, is there any other business to be brought before the County Council? Motion to adjourn. A second? A second. All in favor? Aye. 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 The County Council is adjourned until March 15th, 2022 for our virtual County Council, County Council work session.